and they got away together. And there was a mix-up right there at the start when Count Fleet came over rapidly. And uh, Del Pye was caught in that slight jam. Now, no uh, naked gold shower on the outside. He's stepping to the front. He's got a half a length lead. Blue Swords on the inside is second. And in Burnt Cork is lying third. And Count Fleet with Johnny Longdon taking no chances. Driving him right through in the middle. He's in now in third place. They're going to the turn. And it's gold shower on the lead by three quarters of a length. Count Fleet is in second place. Longdon taking no chances with him. His second. Burnt Cork is third on the outside, and Blue Sarge is two lengths away in fourth place. And right after them, we've got Amber Light back there in fifth place. So far, being outrun, slide rule is in sixth. And while I'm talking to you, Count Fleet is going up and challenging Gold Shower for the lead. He is out to set a new record today if he can do it. And he's going to the brunt with a crowd roaring down here. Already, with only half a mile gone, Count Fleet is stepping on the lead by two lengths. Gold Shower is tired in second place, three lengths in front of Blue Sarge. And now Slide Rule is moving through on the inside and is going up to get third place. They're going up very fast on Count Fleet. Count Fleet is now only two lengths in front. Gold Shower is second by a length. Slide Rule on the inside is third. Blue Sarge is fourth. And on the outside, Amber Light is making his challenge. The others are driving hard and beaten. It is Amber Light coming fastest of anybody. And Count Fleet is now only a length in front. Blue Sarge is making a challenge at him. But Johnny Longdon said, come on. And Count Fleet pulled away in those two strides to open a gap of two and a half lengths as they come back to the starting point and only 400 yards now to come count fleet is two and a half almost three lengths in the lead slide rule cut that corner driving hard on the inside to get to second place longdon has taken two flashes over his shoulder but that blue swords is a game horse he's making one more challenge at him and longdon is taking no chances he's swinging the whip at count fleet but count fleet is safe Count Fleet is home for the Kentucky Derby with 150 yards to come, 50 yards, and it's Count Fleet easing up by three lengths. Blue Stars is second by five lengths. Slide Rule is third by eight lengths. Amber Light is fourth. Dang Cup is fifth. Dub Pie is sixth. No Wrinkles is seventh. Gold Shower is eighth. Modest Lad is ninth. And Burnt Cork was tenth in the race. The program originally scheduled for this time will be heard immediately after the special broadcast which follows. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. My fellow Americans, I am speaking tonight to the American people, and in particular to those of our citizens who are coal miners. Tonight, this country faces a serious crisis. We are engaged in a war on the successful outcome of which will depend the whole future of our country. This war has reached a new critical phase. After the years that we have spent in preparation, we have moved into active and continuing battle with our enemies. We are pouring into the worldwide conflict everything that we have our young men, and the vast resources of our nation. I have just returned from a two weeks tour of inspection on which I saw, saw our men being trained and our war materials made. My trip took me to 20 states. I saw a thousand workers on the production, making airplanes, and guns, and ammunition. Everywhere I found great eagerness to get on with the war. Men and women are working long hours at difficult jobs and living under difficult conditions without complaint. Along thousands of miles of track, I saw countless acres of newly plowed fields. The farmers of this country are planting the crops that are needed to feed our armed forces, our civilian population, and our allies. Those crops will be harvested. On my trip, I saw hundreds of thousands of soldiers, young men who were green recruits last autumn, have matured into self-assured and hardened fighting men. They are in splendid physical condition. They are mastering the superior weapons that we are pouring out of our factory. The American people have accomplished a miracle. However, all of our massed effort is none too great 
to meet the demands of this war, we shall need everything that we have and everything that our allies have to defeat the Nazis and the fascists in the coming battles on the continent of Europe and the Japanese on the continent of Asia and in the islands of the Pacific. This tremendous forward movement of the United States and the United Nations cannot be stopped by our enemies. And equally, it must not be hampered by any one individual or by the leader of any one group here back home. I want to make it clear that every American coal miner who has stopped mining coal, no matter how sincere his motives, no matter how legitimate he may believe his grievances to be, every idle miner directly and individually is obstructing our, our, our war effort. We have not yet won this war. We will win this war only as we produce and deliver our total American effort on the high seas and on the battlefront. And that requires unrelenting, uninterrupted effort here on the home front. A stopping of the coal supply, even for a short time, would involve a gamble with the lives of American soldiers and sailors and the future security of our whole people. It would involve an unwarranted, unnecessary, and terribly dangerous gamble with our chances for victory. Therefore, I say to all miners and to all Americans everywhere at home and abroad, the production of coal will not be stopped. Tonight, I am speaking to the essential patriotism of the miners and to the patriotism of their wives and children. And I am going to state the true facts of this case as simply and as plainly as I know how. After the attack at Pearl Harbor, the three great labor organizations, the American Federation of Labor, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, and the Railroad Brotherhood, gave the positive assurance that there would be no strikes as long as the war lasted. And the President of the United Mine Workers of America was a party to that assurance. That pledge was applauded throughout the country. It was a forcible means of telling the world that we Americans, 135 million of us, are united in our determination to fight this total war with our total will and our total power. At the request of employers and of organized labor, including the United Mine Workers, the War Labor Board was set up for settling any disputes which could not be adjusted through collective bargaining. The War Labor Board is a tribunal on which workers and employers and the general public are equally represented. In the present coal crisis, conciliation and mediation were tried unsuccessfully. In accordance with the law, the case was then certified to the War Labor Board, the agency created for this express purpose with the approval of organized labor. The members of the board followed the usual practice, which has proved successful in other disputes, Acting promptly, they undertook to get all the facts of this case from both the miners and the operators. The national officers of the United Mine Workers, however, declined to have anything to do with the fact-finding of the War Labor Board. And the only excuse that they offer is that the War Labor Board is prejudiced. 
The War Labor Board has been and is ready to give the case a fair and impartial hearing. And I have given my assurance that if any adjustment of wages is made by the board, it will be made retroactive to April 1st. But the national officers of the United Mine Workers refused to participate in the hearing when asked to do so last Monday. On Wednesday of this past week, while the board was proceeding with the case, stoppages began to occur in some mines. On Thursday morning, I telegraphed to the officers of the United Mine Workers asking that the miners continue mining coal on Saturday morning. However, a general strike throughout the industry became effective on Friday night. The responsibility for the crisis that we now face rests squarely on these national officers of the United Mine Workers and not on the government of the United States. But the consequences of this arbitrary action threaten all of us everywhere. At 10 o'clock yesterday morning, Saturday, the government took over the mines. I called upon the miners to return to work for their government. The government needs their services just as surely as it needs the services of our soldiers and sailors and marines and the services of the millions who are turning out the munitions of war. You miners have sons from the Army and Navy and Marine Corps. You have sons who at this very minute, this split second, may be fighting in New Guinea or in the Aleutian Islands or Guadalcanal or Tunisia or China or protecting troop ships and supplies against submarines on the high seas. We have already received telegrams from some of our fighting men overseas, and I only wish they could tell you what they think of the stoppage of work in the coal mines. Some of your own sons have come back from the fighting fronts wounded. A number of them, for example, are now here in an army hospital in Washington. Several of them have been decorated by their government. I could tell I could tell one of you, tell you of one from Pennsylvania. He was a coal miner before his induction, and his father is a coal miner. He was seriously wounded by Nazi machine gun bullets while he was on a bombing mission over Europe in a flying fortress. Another boy from Kentucky, the son of a coal miner, was wounded when our troops first landed in North Africa six months ago. There's another from Illinois. He was a coal miner. His father, his father and two birds our coal mines. He was seriously wounded in Tunisia while attempting to rescue two comrades whose jeep had been blown up by a Nazi mine. These men do not consider themselves heroes. They'd probably be embarrassed if I mentioned their names over the air. They were wounded in the line of duty. They know how essential it is to the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and ultimately millions of other young Americans to get the best of arms and equipment into the hands of our fighting forces and get them there quickly. The fathers and mothers of our fighting men, their brothers and sisters and friends, and that includes all of us, are also in the line of duty, the production line. Any failure in production may well result in costly defeat on the field of battle. 
There can be no one among us, no one faction powerful enough to interrupt the forward march of our people to victory. You miners have ample reason to know that there are certain basic rights for which this country stands, and that those rights are worth fighting for and worth dying for. That is why you have sent your sons and brothers from every mining town in the nation to join in the great struggle overseas. That is why you have contributed so generously, so willingly, to the purchase of war bonds and to the many funds for the relief of war victims here and in foreign lands. That is why, since this war was started in 1939, you have increased the annual production of coal by almost 200 million tons a year. The toughness of your sons and our armed forces is not surprising. They come of fine, rugged stock. Men who work in the mines are not unaccustomed to hardship. It's been the objective of this government to reduce that hardship, to obtain for miners and for all who do the nation's work a better standard of living. I know only too well that the cost of living is troubling the miners' families and troubling the families of millions of other workers throughout the country as well. A year ago, it became evident to all of us that something had to be done about living costs. Your government determined not to let the cost of living continue to go up as it did in the First World War, your government has been determined to maintain stability of both prices and wages so that a dollar would buy so far as possible the same amount of the necessities of life. And by necessities, I mean just that. Not the luxury, not the fancy goods that we have learned to do without in wartime. So far, we have not been able to keep the prices of some necessities as low as we should have liked to keep them. That is true not only in coal towns, but in many, many other places. Wherever we find that prices of essentials have risen too high, they will be brought down. Wherever we find that price ceilings are being violated, the violators will be punished. Rents have been fixed in most parts of the country. In many cities, they've been cut to below where they were before we entered the war. Clothing prices have generally remained stable. These two items pick up more than a third of the total budget of the workers' family. As for food, which today accounts for about another third of the family expenditure on the average, I want to repeat again, your government will continue to take all necessary measures to eliminate unjustified, avoidable price increases. And we are today taking measures to roll back the prices of meats. This war is going to go on. Coal will be mined, no matter what any individual thinks about it. The operation of our factories, our power plants, our railroads will not be stopped. Our munitions must move to our troops. And so under these circumstances, it is inconceivable that any patriotic miner can choose any course other than going back to work and mining coal. The nation cannot afford violence of any kind, the coal mines or in coal towns. I have placed authority for the resumption of coal mining in the hands of a civilian, the Secretary of the Interior. If it becomes necessary to protect any miner 
who seeks patriotically to go back and work, and that miner must have, and his family must have, and will have, complete and adequate protection. If it becomes necessary to have troops at the mine mouths or in coal towns for the protection of working miners and their families, those troops will be doing police duty for the sake of the nation as a whole, and particularly for the sake of the fighting men in the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, your sons and mine who are fighting our common enemies all over the world. I understand the devotion of the coal miners to their union. I know of the sacrifices they have made to build it up. I believe now, as I have all my life, in the rights of workers to join unions and to protect their unions. I want to make it absolutely clear that this government is not going to do anything now to weaken those rights in the coal fields. Every improvement of the conditions of the coal miners of this country has had my hearty support, and I do not mean to desert them now. But I also do not mean to desert my obligations and responsibilities as President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. The first necessity is the resumption of coal mining. The terms of the old contract will be followed by the Secretary of the Interior. If an adjustment in wages results from a decision of the War Labor Board or from any new agreement between the operators and miners, which is approved by the War Labor Board, that adjustment as I have said before, will be made retroactive to April 1st. In the message that I delivered to the Congress four months ago, I expressed my conviction that the spirit of this nation is good. Since then, I have seen our troops in the Korean area, in bases on the coasts of our, our ally, Brazil, and in North Africa. Recently, I have again seen great numbers of our fellow countrymen, soldiers and civilians, from the Atlantic seaboard to the Mexican border and to the Rocky Mountains. Tonight, in the face of a crisis of serious proportions in the coal industry, I say again that the spirit of this nation is good. I know that the American people will not tolerate any threat offered to their government by anyone. I believe the coal miners will not continue the strike against their government. I believe that the coal miners, as Americans, will not fail to heed the clear call to duty. Like all other good Americans, they will march shoulder to shoulder with our armed forces to victory. Tomorrow, the stars and stripes will fly over the coal mines. And I hope that every miner will be at work under that flag. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem.
Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the President of the United States. This is the Blue Network. This is the National News Bulletin, a summary of the day's news. Tunis and Gazeta have been captured. The Russians have destroyed more than 400 Nazi planes in the past 48 hours. Tonight, the Union Jack and the Stars and Stripes are flying over the smoking cities of Tunis and Bizetta. Axis offenses collapsed after a tremendous 36-hour offensive by the American Corps and the British First Army. During the day, the Americans advanced nine miles, the British 14. The combined Anglo-American offensive was so perfectly timed that the two cities fell within five minutes of each other. Bizetta was taken by the Americans and French at 4.15 p.m., and Tunis by the British at 4.20, Tunis in time. As night fell, fighting was still continuing inside the narrow streets of both cities. Some dispatches said later, however, that all resistance inside Tunis and Bizetta had apparently stopped. Thousands of prisoners have been taken, and the number is growing hourly. No estimate has been made as to the total, and a definite count may not be made for some time. Part of the Axis army, however, is heading for Cape Bon a rocky peninsula which juts into the Mediterranean east of the fallen cities. Some enemy troops are in the hills between Tunis and Bizetta, others are in the south, but the Eighth Army is expected to look after them. The Owens, Illinois Glass Company, developers of Duraglass containers, in cooperation with the United States government, presents a new radio program dedicated to your health, happiness, and prosperity. Each day at this time, Mondays through Fridays, you will hear your home front reporter, Fletcher Wiley. With the David Brookman Orchestra and singing star, Frank Parker. Keep the home fires burning. And the soprano voice of lovely Eleanor Stever. To help keep the home fires burning more brightly than ever, to help keep Americans on the home front more happy than ever, the Owens, Illinois Glass Company presents two of the nation's favorite voices for your entertainment and Mrs. America's favorite radio visitor for your well-being. Now, here he is, Fletcher Wiley. Thank you, Ben Grower. And the best of the day to all of you out there. You know, it seems kind of good to be visiting you by microphone again. And this time, just to play safe on being welcome, I brought some talent with me. And don't say for a change, please. You know, I've got the doggone this job this time that anyone ever dreamed of. Kind of a commentator's paradise. I can't believe it myself. I haven't any long-winded commercials, nothing to sell, no box tops, no wrappers. I'm not even giving away seeds with a dime to cover the cost of mailing. Here's a show that is conceived and paid for by my sponsors, the Owens, Illinois Glass People, as a contribution to the war. Maybe I shouldn't have said that uh, I haven't anything to sell because I'm going to sell you sell you on an all-out participation in the war effort. Now, here's the way it works. I've got a man down in Washington cooperating with the government to do nothing but chase down the items of news that affect you. Ration news, impending and existing shortages, rulings on housing, rentals, wages, finding out what you can do to help us, and by us I mean you and me and the folks next door and the government. Help us to kick those buck teeth right out of Tojo's trap and to make little Adolf pull out his trick mustache. This show is to help the government, the Red Cross, the parent teachers, the schools, the clubs, and individual housewives do a better job of the helping that we all want to do. But most of all, what we're trying to do is to help you. It's to bring you all of the latest up-to-the-minute information on your personal problems 
the inside lowdown on foods and how to utilize them. Because the proper use of the foodstuffs that are valuable can have a tremendous effect in hastening the day that we take these maniacs into camp. And incidentally, it should be borne in mind that the improper use and the wasting of foodstuff, the failing to do our individual bits, can get us licked. Where the usual commercial advertising would ordinarily go into a show, we're going to put some information in there that will help you to help win the war right in your own bailiwick. We're going to solicit your own individual suggestions and ideas. When we get good ones, we're going to pass them on so that everyone can use them. For example, I was talking with a woman's magazine editor, uh, Eleanor Howe, the other day. She was telling me about a little hint for whipping this low-pressure cream you get nowadays. You know, that 18% kind? You can crank your arm off, but you can't whip it. But if you just add a little lemon juice, it does the trick. We're going to try and eliminate this expression, isn't it awful, that we break out with because we couldn't buy some bacon. We're going to curb hysteria. We're going to make people ashamed to beef about minor inconveniences and privations when the kid next door is taking it on the button down in Africa. We're going to try to enlist your aid in curbing the waste that automatically pays a Jap dividend to the enemies of our country. And we're going to do this sandwiched in between fine music, nice voices, and you can describe what it is I do for a living to suit yourself. I never could figure it out. Anyway, we want your help. We want you to listen. We want you to get everyone you know to listen. Here's a program conceived in patriotism and unselfishly dedicated to a high purpose. I'm proud to be on this end of it, and I think you're going to be proud to be on your end. So much for our purpose now. Let's get into our program. So, David, if you'll wave the magic wand that starts the orchestra, I want the folks to hear one of our sweetest songs by one of our best-loved singers, Frank Parker, as he sings, Begin the Begin.
one thing we're going to bring you to is music that you can understand, that you can feel, you know. Well, here we go. I'm going to talk a little bit about manners. Manners are something that, like charity, should begin at home. It doesn't. It's amazing how many put People put on their good manners like they do their pants, and they take them off just about as readily and easily. I know people that are just, oof, so polite when you get them out in the crowd. And as they go in the front door, the wife stumbles. They say, be careful, darling. You'll break your darn neck. They waste all of their attention, all of their politeness, all of their manners on people other than the people that would be most interested in getting that attention. And it's an amazing thing. It's a silly thing. I wonder why it is that people haven't stopped to figure out that it doesn't pay to hurt people's feelings, even if you happen to be related to them, by marriage or otherwise. You wouldn't haul off and uh, tell the boss's wife what you thought of the get-up she had on, but you wouldn't hesitate to... Tell your wife, if you're a Mr. Average guy, that what she's wearing for a hat looks like it was cut out of the top of a can. And uh, you wonder why the reaction isn't favorable to an attitude of that kind. And people that have pretty good sense do that, too. Kind of surprises you how somebody is smart enough to run a big business isn't smart enough to get along with his own family. And some woman that's big shot enough to be the Number one gal in the PTA isn't smart enough to pass on some of that diplomacy as soon as she closes the front door behind her. But it's true that it works out that way. People who have children that the neighbors refer to as that impossible brat down the street are generally responsible for that. If mother flies off at father or father doesn't hes hesitate to unload his frank and free opinion of mother, you, how do you figure the kids are going to do anything but pick up that same habit? They're a 100% cinch to do just exactly that. If you teach them manners, youngsters won't go busting in and out of the house, walking into any room unbidden if you'll uh, try knocking on their door before you go into their room. Very simple. Do as you would be done by in that one. Kids are imitators. They're just like monkeys. And get on the beam. Give them the right thing to imitate. Another thing that uh, is kind of surprising is the misuse of expressions like please and thank you and I'm sorry. Most of them are just about as sincere as the... Uh, very truly yours at the bottom of a collection agency's letter that's writing you for a five-year-old bad bill. They are yours, I don't think. So when you say thank you in that tone of voice, what have you got? Nothing. But if you sincerely thank someone and say, gee, that was swell of you, I didn't expect that, but I do appreciate it, thanks a lot. You made a friend. If you're going to apologize for something that you do by one of those cold, I'm sorry, forget it, skip it. If you can't make a sincere apology, don't make any. Just overlook it completely. Because an apology that isn't sincere is like one of those fishy handshakes people give you, you know, it's like a glove full of mush. Doesn't mean anything. If you go to someone and have to make an apology and be man or woman enough to make one if, you, if one is due, then make it like you're really sorry. And in nine cases out of ten, you embarrass the other person so much that they, they want you to lay off. And you had people get sorry for something they've done to you and you say, no, that's all right, Joe, skip it. You know, you're a good guy, didn't mean anything. But those, those kind of apologies that are made without sincerity... 
You say way deep down in your soul case that fellow didn't mean that at all. Another place where politeness will pay you some dividends is with people that have to wait on you. A woman that goes down and has some poor little shop girl whose feet hurt her and who's been on them about seven and a half hours and who's already taken an awful beating from a bunch of bargain hunters, a woman who returns a piece of oil cloth because there's a rip in it, jumps all over the kid. The kid don't own the department store. If she talks back to you, she's insulting a customer and she'll get fired. That's just exactly like picking on someone who has their hands tied behind it. And it isn't a very nice thing to do, and it's a sad misuse of manners. If you uh, howl your head off and demand the very superlative in service every time you go in a restaurant, you'll probably wind up, wind up with a waiter's thumb in your soup. You're entitled, and most places will correct any mistake, but you don't have to howl your head off. The waiter didn't cook the steak that's not well enough done to suit you. And, you know, I have found invariable. In encountering big people at the top of the heap, they're all smart enough to know that that's how they got up there. That's how they stay there, too. If I keep this up very long, I won't have a friend left in uh, either the studio because I'm firing this at the orchestra here as well as you, and I won't have any friends left out there either. But you kind of get the general idea. Take a lesson from the service station attendant. He's internationally famous for his good manners as a pattern of courtesy and willingness. So kind of tamp that down in the pipe and draw on it. So much for that. And now I want to perform a little job that is indeed a pleasure. Some of the boys would give their right arm to be seated right where I am now. But it's no dice. If the front pages of our magazines indicate anything... This country is more than a little allergic to beauty, and I wish you could get a load of Miss Tebrew. It's a rare enough thing to find a really beautiful voice, and when you hook it up with a really beautiful girl, it's doggone near overpowering. I'm not kidding. And then, then, for a plus, you had a homey, amiable disposition that didn't hesitate to discuss victory gardening with me. You can understand my enthusiasm. I can understand why the critics have done such a rave over her work down at the Metropolitan. She's going to sing a song that we all love and always will love, accompanied by David Brooklyn's orchestra. Eleanor Steber sings, Carry Me Back to Old Virginia.
and that's well. You, you know, just anybody can like music like that. Incidentally, that's the kind of music we're going to give you. Well, I'm going to take time out here in order to talk a little bit about a food product. I'm going to talk about one that you know very little and don't get alarmed. I'm not going to sell you any of it. I just want to tell you about it because I want you to meet it. I'm talking a little about soya beans. Most people's acquaintance with the soya bean is limited to that funny-looking and tasting sauce that you find in a little cruet on the tables of all Chinese restaurants and pour over the top of your chow mein. That's made from soya bean. But it's one of the most important vegetables in the world. One of the outstanding reasons for the Japs invading and seizing part of Manchuria, Manchukuo, was in order to protect themselves against the chance of losing that as a source of soya beans. About five million long tons, two-thirds of the entire world crop, of soya beans grown in Manchuria. The Japs needed them, needed them badly, because way back in 29, they were buying and importing into their own country about $67 million worth of soya beans in addition to growing everything they could of their own. Now, this bean is just coming into prominence here, and you're going to, you're going to be meeting it pretty quick because the government's backing it up. But they've used it in the Orient for 500 centuries. That's a long time. Now, that's a typographical error on my note. It's only 50 centuries, 5,000 years. A little error is nothing new with me, though. Now, this bean is a fine pasture, swell pasture. You feed the tops of it to the stock. They thrash out the beans. The beans yield a very rich oil, and the residue is pet pressed into a bean cake that has wide uses. Now, out of soya bean oil, they make a substitute for salad and cooking oils. They make butter, lard, and margarine. They get glycerin out of it, which is vital to the manufacture of explosives. It's used in paint, soap, linoleum, rubber substitutes, printer's ink. The cake is used as a fertilizer. It's fed to cattle. They've even burned it as fuel, and millions of people's lives have been saved in the Orient in the periodic famines they have known by men subsisting on this soya bean cake. They even raise the kids on a milk made from it. They heat the soya bean oil, add water to it, put it in water and heat it. It makes a milk. And it makes a balanced ration milk, too. They raise babies completely on it. Don't be surprised if the peculiar taste that you might find in your coffee at your favorite restaurant is due to the fact that anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of soya beans are introduced because it's an excellent coffee substitute. During the Civil War in this country, it was very widely used as a coffee odor and a coffee color. Now they're putting out a soya bean flour... And you put this into a soup, and it acts almost like a beef extract. Those bouillon cubes, many of them that are very popular in Europe, have been made with a soya bean base. The Japs are manufacturing explosives out of it, and so are we. And when you figure out that for troops that are actually fighting out in the field, the Japs are able to fight on the diet of bean soup, bean curd, soya bean flour, soya bean meal, and coffee, all taken from this one product. It is regarded as equal, if not greater, importance than rice. Now, I want to suggest that you take advantage of the opportunity that will soon be yours to try this new product that we're going to pitch right back in Tojo's teeth. And this time, he isn't going to be so fond of soya beans, not the ones that are labeled grown in the USA. You know, one of the things I've always had a hankering to do has been to take two really fine voices and put them together in an old-fashioned duet. And I've finally gotten that opportunity. I don't think that anyone will disagree with me that in Frank Parker and Eleanor Steber, I've got a couple of people that can really sing. The idea met the immediate approval of them both, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening as they sing, Dearly Beloved. Oh! 
Before we leave the air, I want to call your attention to something that you may have overlooked. Now, there are a lot of victory gardens being planted and containers for canning altogether aren't too easy to obtain. Kind of tough. Remember and save the wide-mouthed containers like your vacuum-packed coffee jars. Buy your help. Buy yourself a handful of these little thrifty lids. You can get them down at your grocer's or hardware store all over the country. And you'll have something to pack some of your Victory Garden surplus in. And to put up some fruit in when the peak of the season makes it available at its lowest prices. Take this little sensible economical tip and add a little bonus to your ration point allowance. One other thing. Here's a little pointer I picked up in the door to glass ad in this week's Collier's. Go over and take a look in that cabinet under your sink or wherever you put your pet collection of junk, the catch-all, and you'll probably find anywhere from 1 to 16 milk bottles in there, maybe just plain empty or filled with odds and ends of screws and bolts and nuts. Empty these out and give them back to the milkman. He needs them. Every milk bottle returned promptly helps conserve material, man hours, and shipping space. Well, it's about time for us to shove off. But in case you're staying home tonight, it'll interest you to know that your old friend Bing Crosby has some extra fun up his sleeve along about 9 o'clock Eastern wartime. The regular gang that hangs around the craft music hall will be there, of course, besides which a fellow named Rags Ragland will be on deck to make a lot of fun out of a lot of nonsense. At any rate, give Bing a listen. I really think you'll be giving yourself a treat, so listen to Bing tonight, and, uh, of course, don't forget to listen for us tomorrow. Thank you. Good afternoon. Tomorrow at this same time, the Owens, Illinois Glass Company, developers of Duraglass containers in cooperation with the United States government, sends you another of these programs dedicated to your health, happiness, and prosperity with songs by Eleanor Stever and Frank Parker, music by the David Brookman Orchestra, and words from Mrs. America's favorite radio visitor, your home front reporter, Fletcher Wiley. This is Ben Grauer speaking. Company, developers of Duraglass containers, in cooperation with the United States government, presents a new radio program dedicated to the health and happiness of wartime America. Each weekday at this time, you will hear your home front reporter, Fletcher Wiley, with David Brookman's music, our singing tenor star, Frank Parker, and the lovely soprano voice of Eleanor Stever of the Metropolitan Opera. program, Mrs. America, presented by Owens, Illinois, two of the nation's favorite voices to bring you the best in musical entertainment, and your favorite radio visitor to keep you in touch with the home front in wartime, your home front reporter, Fletcher Wiley. Thank you, you Conover. You remember to tell him I want a higher table. I can't get my big, long legs under this one. <laughs> and the best of the day to all of you out there. Well, here we go in the second lap of this particular opera. And I'm glad to say that I'm still in the commentator's heaven. You can't send in anything and get anything in return for it. 
We're going to try and continue to keep you posted, and I'll have to explain this the first few shows we have, and then I promise to cut it out because it doesn't interest me either. But I want to explain to you that this is a show for your benefit calculated to try and help you. This show is to help people, the government, the Red Cross, all of the organizations that are trying to help us do a good job. We are inclined to want to uh, hurt a few of them, too. We don't carry any particularly excellent wishes for little Tojo sitting on his island in the Pacific, or Mr. Schickel Gruber sitting on his mountain. And if we can do a little something along that line to bring about the day to which we're all looking forward, why, we haven't done so bad. Besides which, we have a little entertainment on this show, some good music. And to start the music off, uh, we have the personable personality of uh, Eleanor Stieber. She's daring me to do something I'm going to do a little bit later on, too. You know the song that Eleanor is going to sing is a song that is particularly dear to me. Out in California, there's a very lovely old little lady who sang this song to me when I was a kid. You know, Eleanor sings it almost as sweetly. It's, remember, just a song at twilight. David Brookman starts her off. Let's see what we have from the man down in Washington. 
First, because there's so much good news in the general news from abroad, I would like to repeat a little quotation that a chap by the name of Polybius made 125 years before the birth of Christ. It's something to bear in mind at these times when you're inclined to get a little too optimistic. He said, It is no doubt a good thing to conquer on the field of battle, but it needs greater wisdom and greater skill to make use of victory. And the Japs have a, a little proverb that we might bear in mind. There's an old Jap proverb that says, After a victory, tighten your helmet strap. So, uh, don't get too optimistic. There's a lot left to be done. It will be done. But you want to bear in mind that it has to be done, and it hasn't been done yet. Well, here's the dope. There are a lot of spuds, new white potatoes coming in the market, and there are lots of green peas. According to the information we get down there, they're moving in car lots. They've been classified as victory foods, and they should be on your table. They're good food, and the government's putting on a very brisk drive to combat any attempt to create a black market and early crop potatoes. And you may rest assured that violators of the prices as outlined under the new rulings will be saying, good morning, judge. I sincerely hope that you might make it possible for one of them to put out that greeting yourself. Don't spare the horses. Also, if you've been worried about how you're going to get up in the morning... They're cutting the rope that's been tying up all the alarm clocks. For a dollar and sixty-five cents, you'll be able to be miserably unhappy every morning on time now, presently. That's uh, plus taxes, state and local and stuff. Of course, you've got about a five-to-one chance to get yours. I think they're going to make a million seven hundred and fifty thousand out of normal ten million used. Did you realize that many people had to be nudged to get them up in the morning? Ten million of them? And I don't imagine it's getting any better. The price control thing, which we discussed a little bit yesterday and which we'll discuss some more, is making rapid headway and will very soon be effective for you and for all of us all over the country. And it's going to be up to you to see that you are not overcharged, and it's going to be up to you to do one more thing in cooperation with the government, and that is to perhaps change the eating habits in your own home. You know, eating is largely a question of habit. You get into some sections of the country and they relish things that you wouldn't even mention in polite society in this section. And it's amazing how easily we switch over. One of my pet stories is the story of the woman that had the cat that wouldn't eat anything but sardines and hard-boiled eggs. Finally decided to leave town and Tried to give the cat away, and nobody wanted a cat with that expensive an appetite. So they finally very hard-heartedly moved out of the village and left this cat. After been gone about 30 days, uh, my dad did this. He came home and he said to my mother, You remember that cat that wouldn't eat anything but sardines and hard-boiled eggs? He said, Yes. He said, I just saw him out in the alley chewing on a bootleg. And, you know, there are a lot of us that can change our eating habits if we have to, and your family is no exception. And this is a very good time to require them to change some of those eating habits. Just introduce them to us, and there's nothing else there. They'll move in and do their stuff in a very satisfactory manner. Now let's have a little more music. Frank, come on, get up. It's about time for you to go to work. Frank and... Uh, Dave Brookman have cooked up something this time. Do you like The Night is Young and You're So Wonderful? The breezes sing of it 
Can't you get into the swing of it, lady? When do we start? When the lady is kissable and the evening is cool, any dream is permissible in the heart of a fool. And if I seem over amorous lady, what can I do? said that when Miss Steerberg walked up the microphone a little while ago, she reminded me of something she did. She reminded me that I had a message to deliver to the ladies about stockings. Did that come out of me? <laughs> there goes Parker. Well, I'll tell you. I want to assure you that you can stop pestering all your friends who come to the big city about would they please bring you back some nylons. Give up. It's, they're having just as tough a time here as they're having in your town. And about the best satisfaction that I've been able to dig out is that if you wash the rayons and let them dry for about 36 hours, they don't give you that stocking at Christmas time with an orange in it effect that uh, sometimes complain about. Let them dry about 36 hours and they don't stretch so much. Now, there's a household hint that if you're not already aware of, will do you some good. That uh, came direct from Grandmother Arkansas, <laughs> who insisted that I get it in here. That's our producer, in case you didn't know. You know, I read an interesting little story about trees. Trees and snobbery. I was reading a yarn about the famous trees we have in this country, about the Washington elm and the William Penn elm. That was the one that the treaty between the Quakers and the Indians is made. The only treaty never sworn to and never broken, so history says. We've heard about the Charter Oak and the Emancipation Oak. But uh, I wonder if you've ever heard of one of our most famous trees. This is a little story about a handful of acorns that were sent by the former Tsar Nicholas II of Russia to Theodore Roosevelt when he was president of this country. The gift was brought by our then ambassador when he returned to this country, and there was quite a yarn in connection with it. Alexander was one of the greatest of the... or Alexander I, back in... well, I think his reign ended in about 1825. He was one of the greatest of the Tsars. 
And at the time of the reign of Alexander I, we had a kind of a pompous fathead who was our minister over there, very much on dignity and manner and prestige and stuff and things. And one day, an American sailor boy came in to see him, just an ordinary sailor off a boat. He'd made a trip of ten days to the capital to be ushered into the presence of this pompous old windbag and... He got in there and explained that he wanted to see the Tsar. He'd brought a gift from the Tsar, some acorns that he'd gathered at Mount Vernon, Washington's home. And he'd heard that Alexander was a wise and kindly man and that he'd had a great admiration for Washington and he'd brought him over this gift. And the minister practically blew his top. That was just ridiculous. Sailor, get in to see the Tsar of all the Russias? Uh Uh-uh. So the minister shooed him out of there. A couple of mornings afterwards, he got up and went over and opened the blinds and looked out, and here's a great big carriage all done up with gold and gilt and with about four outriders and about four footmen and beautiful black horses and a military escort. Minister thought the czar must have come to call on him with such a great display, and the door opens and out gets his sailor kid. Comes in, pays a little call on him, told him he just thought he'd drop by. He'd been up to see the czar. And the czar had given him this carriage in order to look the community over. It seems the kid went up and bumped into an officer at the gates of the palace. And the fellow was kind of kindly looking, went up and told him his story. And the officer said, come with me. Took him into the inner gardens. Introduced him to the czar. And the czar took this little handful of acorns the kid gave him and went in and planted took the youngster right with him and planted these acorns in the royal ground. And you know those acorns that were planted by the first Alexander were the ones that came back as a present to Theodore Roosevelt subsequently, having made the trip from this country to Russia and back again. The object in telling that story at this particular time on my part is simply to maybe help all of us to kind of deflate a little bit. This is no time for being ultra-pompous. Let's see what I've got here now. Oh, yeah. You know, out in California, we have a chap by the name of Jerome Kern. Writes quite some songs. Songs we don't forget, like Why Do I Love You from Showboat. That's a duet, they tell me. So Eleanor Steber and Frank Parker... Take it away. It's all yours. Why do I love you? Why do you love me? Why should there be two?
You know, I picked up a little pointer in a Dura glass ad in Collier's a couple of weeks ago. How's about you going over and digging into that box under the sink, the one with the catch that's hard to work, and getting out those hoarded-up milk bottles you've got there and giving them back to the milkman? He can use them. And uh, you really have no particular use for them. They save man hours, labor, and materials that are needed at this time. So come on, and will you really give? And if tonight you're planning to curl up in front of the radio, here's a little suggestion that you uh, tune in on Al's Olson's show. Al's got uh, Mr. Beaver, the man who came to dinner, Monty Woolley with him. Give a listen, and you'll like. And don't forget to listen to us tomorrow, too. This is Fletcher Wiley saying thank you and good afternoon. Tomorrow at this same time, Owens, Illinois, developers of Dora Glass Containers, in cooperation with the United States government, sends you another of these programs dedicated to the health and happiness of wartime America. With songs by Eleanor Stever and Frank Parker, music by David Brookman, and this is America's favorite visitor, Fletcher Wiley, your home front reporter. Hugh Conover speaking. Broadcasting System. Illinois Glass Company, developers of Dura Glass Containers, in cooperation with the United States government, presents a new radio program dedicated to the health and happiness of wartime America. Each weekday at this time, you will hear your home front reporter, Fletcher Wiley, with David Brookman's music, our singing tenor star, Frank Parker, and the lovely soprano voice of Eleanor Stever of the Metropolitan Opera. your program, Mrs. America, presented by Owens, Illinois, two of the nation's favorite voices to bring you the best in musical entertainment, and your favorite radio visitor to keep you in touch with a home front in wartime, your home front reporter, Fletcher Wiley. Thank you, Hugh Conover, and the best of the day to all of you out there. Well, let's see, the sponsors set up the time, and I'm here to do my daily stint seeing if we can't help in some way to figure out your exact place in this war. As the home front reporter, I want to do what I can, all that I can, to, to find various ways that you can back up your government. And the boys out in the fighting fronts, sometimes we'll talk about Washington and what's going on down there that interests you. Sometimes it'll be the Red Cross, the Parent Teachers Association, or the other local organizations that tie in one way or another with this war effort. You might talk about little things that might help around the house. That reminds me, somebody dug up a suggestion of the window stick when you're doing the repainting. Instead of exercising your arms and your vocabulary, just pull up the cords that hold the weights and let them go plunk. And jars that stuck paint loose and save a little trouble. But there's more to this show than just talking. We have some music also. 
You uh, got a little touch of it when we came on the air. I mean, Frank Parker and Eleanor Steber, Dave Brookman's orchestra. Frank opens our singing department today with a song I'm sure you all know and like, One Alone. Dave Brookman, if you please. I may wander where I please, yet I keep on longing just to rest a while. Where a sweetheart's tender eyes takes the place of sand and skies, all the world for a in one woman. My worshipping soul possesses At her call I give my all All my life and all my love And you This would be a man Magic world to me if she were mine. take just a little bit of time here to make some suggestions to you that can be of great value. One of the difficult things for most of us to do is to appreciate how it can be possible that the little that we figure our contribution in any mass movement is, how that little can help. Well, you take almost anything and Multiply it by 120 million and it adds up. That's the way most of the great fortunes have been made, is in little bits oft repeated. The Office of Defense Transportation, which has got a staggering job on its shoulders, trying to make people use their cars less and be happy about it, which is quite a chore. They're very anxious that you and your automobile do what you can to make this war effort more effective. Now, there are a lot of things you can do. One thing that you can start in doing is taking care of that family jalopy. Every time you buy a car, they always have told you, grease the thing every thousand miles and change the oil in it. And about 80% of you can plead guilty right now to never having done this. 
You don't need to get amazed that your repair bill is a lot bigger than the fellow who does do this. I mean, that stunt really works. I can say that from definite personal experience and having tried it out. And it'll work with your car just as well as it will with anyone else. Keep the thing up and it'll run a lot longer and you'll get a lot more mileage out. Now, they, they, they want you to, to lug as many small bundles as you can. They want you to whack up on the riding so that you're sharing the use of your car. They want you to, when you go doing your shopping, to sandwich it in between 10 and 2 to avoid the rush hours on the transportation facilities that are needed for defense workers and people who have to travel. They don't want you to shop at night because those late store hours are for people that have to work can't shop at any other time. It isn't a matter of convenience to you. There are going to be a lot of things we're going to have to do that are matters of inconvenience. But if we understand that, therefore, the, the public wheel and the general good, and if we realize that these things will actually help win the war, there are very few of us that will squawk about doing it. And if you'll do your bit, and never mind about Mrs. Krautsmeyer down the street that you know doesn't do her bit. Forget that. Skip it. Get yourself in the clear. Know that you're doing your part. And know that if all of the other people who hear this little bit of outburst on my part do the same thing, we will have made a magnificent contribution to the war effort. Now, the least you can do is get in there and pitch a little bit. Avoid any unnecessary use of your car. Make it last. Stop letting the kids use it for a joyriding vehicle. Grandma and Grandpa got along pretty well on shanks mares. And you can make your feet save your rubber, too. There's not any question about that. Sure, it's an inconvenience. So what? So is a foxhole full of fleas. And after all, you don't have to put up with that. And there are people that are suffering that inconvenience. And this is one way that you can help. Now it's time for Eleanor Steber. Eleanor is, uh, as you know, from one of the Metropolitan Opera folks. But on this show, there's no costume, and she's just what she really is, swell girl. Very easy on the eyes, too. That's a fact, Eleanor. She just opens her mouth, and this nice voice comes out. Dave Brookman, get the orchestra going. She's going to sing In the Gloom. Eleanor?
Thank you, Eleanor. You know, I like those songs that go back when. Something that we all know and you kind of get in the groove with. Speaking of entertainment, that's one of the major problems of the country today, is the problem of entertainment. We're taking whatever steps is, are practicable, possible, to recognize the need for entertainment on the part of the fellows who are in the service and in the camps, and a great deal of good is being done in that direction. But you know, it's, it's equally important that the people who have to stay home be entertained, too. Radio is part of that. It can't be 100% of it. And I wonder how many people are taking a kind of a biased attitude on the question of women who have... Husbands and sweethearts who are in the service and yet who have to have some form of entertainment. They're not going to stay home and click the knit, knitting needles 24 hours out of every day. And it wouldn't be wise. More and more now, we're having a, a blind date problem, for example. It's funny how mothers, sometimes grandmothers too, who can recall the days when Grandpa used to come over with a newly washed buggy and take them out, get completely horrified when the idea of daughter or granddaughter doing likewise comes up. You'd think that they were entirely different folks. You know, from the conversations that I've had with broad-minded grandmas and grandpas, I don't think that's so. I don't think there's a very great deal of difference. As a matter of fact... Uh, Grandma, on the average, got married a whole lot quicker than the modern generation does. And she had pretty good sense by the time she got along 15, 16 years old. And, and very frequently had her first baby. Now, it's awful hard for the average parent to realize that their children are growing up. But they are. You should know by this time whether or not the possibility of your daughter or your son going out on a date is a major hazard or not. After all, the responsibility for the training of that child is yours. That child should have the habits and the teachings that you put out and is pretty apt to. And if there is a hazard, uh, that's yours too, huh? You know, if you watch people's associates, you needn't be so afraid of the individuals if you are certain that they're associating with the right kind of a group on the whole. These kids are just as sound and just as solid and I think a little bit more sensible than our generation of the one that preceded it. And I don't think there's anything to get alarmed about at all. There are a lot of fine youngsters scattered around over the country who are far away from home and they're making dates. And they're going places. And it may be that some member of your family will be going along. A little investigation is a very wise thing. An investigation of the general nature of the amusement and the entertainment is smart. But don't put your foot down too hard. Don't toss that moldy argument about nice girls don't do such things as go out on blind dates because nice girls do. 
They have before, and I'll bet you a frosted cookie, and I'll only lose about 15% of my bets that uh, you could reach back in the archives of your memory and haul out a blind date or two. Of course, maybe this isn't uh, quite the fair thing to do if daughter happens to be listening at the moment, but I'll even chuck that one at Grandma. And if she's unwilling to break down and confess, the chances are Grandpa can chime in and remind her about the time she forgot. It isn't anything to get excited about. It certainly isn't anything to create a great scene about. If you have a sound reason for not wanting a youngster of yours to go on a blind date with a crowd, put your foot down and say so, but don't hide behind any imaginary objection. Your youngster should be permitted to go out. We need a little entertainment and relaxation. If you simply clamp the lid down too tight, you very frequently result only in having yourself deceived. And you don't want that. Youngsters are pretty prone to live up to the standards that their parents establish for them. It's always amazed me to hear parents low-rating their own children. You know, many a time you plant a suggestion there that you wouldn't for the world deliberately plant, but sometimes that happens. So remember that these are extra strenuous times, times when entertainment is needed by young and old alike. Get your share of it. It makes you better fit for the hardships and the privations and the little things that we have to get along without. And don't establish yourself as the czar or the czarina in your own domestic circle. Just be a pal. It'll pay off. It'll pay off dividends in character and happiness. Well, so much for that. <clears throat> My handsome friend over there, Mr. Brookman, he is handsome, too. He's a very fine sort of fellow. He's a Hollander by birth. But he's chuck up to the neck with love of good American music. And uh, he goes for the kind of stuff we're producing on this show. Today he's fixed up a little treatment of the Missouri Waltz. I saw a door glass ad in the Saturday Evening Post today that made me ask some questions. It was in conjunction with uh, vacuum-packed coffee. You know, that's essential to get good coffee, the very keep it good. And uh, 
The cap that seals the coffee jar used to be made out of material you can't get anymore. Duraglass developed what they call the 63 coffee seal. After you get through using your coffee out of your glass jar, you can get these seals at your grocers and go right on using your coffee jars for home canning. Try that out. That's about all for today. I'll be back tomorrow at the same time. And if you'd like to meet a very pleasant radio family, why not tune in Easy Aces this evening? Jane Ace really does things with the English language that I haven't even tried myself. Don't forget, we'll be back tomorrow. See you in. This is Fletcher Wiley saying thank you and good afternoon. Tomorrow at this same time, Owens, Illinois, developers of Duraglass containers in cooperation with the United States government, send you another of these programs dedicated to the health and happiness of wartime America. With songs by Eleanor Stever and Frank Parker, music by David Brookman, and Mrs. America's favorite visitor, Fletcher Wiley, your home front reporter. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Yesterday afternoon at about 4.30, the war in North Africa came to an end. Early on Tuesday morning, the Axis armies were cut clean in half by the British drive across the neck of the Cape Bon Peninsula. That left mainly the German 90th Light Division to be accounted for, a division of tough veteran fighting troops, some of the finest fighters that ever came out of Germany. In the mountains, they went on fighting until they had little ammunition left. Our troops in the north put down a smoke screen, and under cover of it, they withdrew a little, while our bombers went in in three deadly waves to deliver the last aerial bombardment and one of the heaviest of the whole campaign. When our bombers had finished, our artillery opened up, and soon hundreds of white flags were appearing all over the place. The mass extermination of the Jews in Warsaw began in August 1942. Behind the high wall to the top of which was thrown with glass, half a million of them awaited death. Yet, even as late as the memorable Palm Sunday on 1943, there were still 40 women in the Warsaw Ghetto. These the Germans employed in war industry. The battle of the Ghetto was unexpected. It came as a complete surprise but not to the Polish underground, but long expected that the Germans might attack the ghetto and were determined that they should pay heavily in the attempt. Plans for the defense of the ghetto were entrusted to the commander of the Polish underground army, who was in direct contact with the leaders of the Jewish military organization. Arms and supplies from the stores of the underground army were provided for the Jewish military organization. These were smuggled, into the ghetto by soldiers of the underground army. What brought about the battle of the ghetto? When the German authorities called for 5,000 Jews to come at a fixed hour at the largest square of the ghetto, the Jews well knew the meaning of death order. It was always followed by deportations to camps of extermination. Many victims used to die in agony on their way there. The Jews knew that, and they refused to obey the order. Then the fight began. The Jews destroyed German stores and factories inside the ghetto. On the morning of Palm Sunday, I heard the first sounds of battle. As I was reaching the end of Miodola Street, I saw vast numbers of German police crowding the square. Four field guns were firing incessantly in the direction of the ghetto houses. German armored cars passed me with a roar. I saw a whole SS Waffen detachment marching fully armed to wage battle against these Jews whom they hated and despised. One of their units was trying to storm a gate of the ghetto in Moranowska Street. They were met by a storm of projectiles and hand grenades. Then tanks and armored cars were sent to the ghetto, but they were soon in flames. While the fighting was going on, units of the Polish underground army, under the command of my friends, attacked from the rear the SS soldiers inciting the ghetto. The Germans tried to storm the ghetto with tanks, planes and artillery. For three weeks they attacked again and again, but they failed. Still, the Polish 
and Jewish colors flattered from the racket guest house. Then the Germans adopted another method. They began to burn the houses using their flame trolls. The Jews fought cover in cellars and sewers while the Germans systematically liquidated house after house. The whole of Warsaw was filled with smoke, soot and burned remains of timber and paper which were swept along the streets by the wind. The ghetto which occupied one-sixth of the whole area of Warsaw was reduced to a stony desert. The Germans left only the famous Paviak prison. This was full of Poles awaiting execution. The last stronghold of resistance gave in at the end of June after two months. Some Jews succeeded in escaping and these are now in hiding in Polish houses. They have been provided with fake Polish documents. If they should be found out, both the Jew and the Pole who hides him would be shot immediately. But the battle of the ghetto is only one instance of the everyday drama that is going on in Poland. We used to think out there that the Western world was unable to understand it. To understand this drama, one has to live to it. It's impossible to describe in words. Each Saturday at this time, the National Broadcasting Company presents Morgan Beatty's War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. Morgan Beatty is NBC's veteran war reporter in the British capital. And so for his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is Morgan Beatty in London, looking at the 194th week of war through the War Telescope. For the first time since hostilities began, the United Nations has carried war across the ocean to a major continental victory. In short, we've made war on a large scale at the end of a supply line. By now we know that Eisenhower's genius welded the troops of three nations into a powerful offensive force in North Africa. We know that Alexander's military strategy stripped the enemy of his weapons. We know how Patton's tank made the magic moves outlined by Alexander and how Montgomery held the enemy in a dead-end street in front of Antietamville. But what we haven't been told is how war traveled to North Africa, how the guns and the uniforms and the bandages and jeeps dropped into place at the appointed hour. Today we're going to tell you a part of that story, the part played by the United States Army's Services of Supply in England. The Services of Supply, with our British allies, literally put war into self-opening packages. From the American point of view, General Brayon Somerville is the man behind the packages in Washington. Here in Britain, he has a repackaging unit, or at least a resorting engine, in full operation. Last July, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill gave the orders to take war to Africa. In London, a small group of United States Army officers set to work immediately. They were men like Major General John C.H. Lee, Commanding General of the Services of Supply in the European Theater, and his supply lieutenant, such as Brigadier General Henry P. Saylor, Chief of Ordnance, Robert M. Littlejohn, Chief Quartermaster, Cecil R. Denty Moore, Chief Engineer, Paul R. Hawley, Chief Surgeon, and William S. Rumble, Chief Signal Officer. These men shipped everything from watch springs to 155 millimeter guns. They added cement and gasoline and collapsible houses made in England and shot it all down to North Africa on a split-second schedule. Now these supply men are getting the battle tools ready for action wherever the high command decides to wage war next. They've taken time out of their busy day to tell us something about what it means to provide gunpowder or hospitals at the drop of a hat. Let's start with General Saylor, Chief of Ordnance. General, can't you give us a simple explanation of ordnance? Ordnance is firepower, and firepower will win the war. The more stuff you pour on the enemy, whether you pour it out of a gun or an airplane, the quicker it will be over. But unfortunately, you can't just dump guns and ammunition on the ground and leave it at that. On the North African operation, we had to waterproof vehicles so that they would run through beach water. We couldn't have an engine grinding out like an old Model T crossing a creek. We had to package individual repair kits and mark them. You can't tell a soldier you thought you put his machine gun down on the left side of a road somewhere. He'll be dead by the time he traces your thoughts. That must have meant keeping track of thousands of items, General. Yes, about 180,000, in fact. At one of our depots here, the Transportation Service, 
has laid down facilities enough to handle a freight for a city the size of South Bend, Indiana. Yes, and I've seen an American locomotive operating out there, General, and I've heard that sweet whistle. It's enough to make a man long for home. But thank you, and more firepower to you. Next, there's General Littlejohn, the heart-bitten chief quartermaster. General, what part does the quartermaster in England play in North Africa? We furnished all the food and a high percentage of clothing, gas, and oil for North Africa. The widely separated distances and rapidly moving warfare necessitated the extensive use of what we commonly call reserve rations. On their arrival in Africa, rations were handled by labor that spoke several foreign languages. These men did not know how to sort book shipments. The laborers scrambled the rations, and our soldiers found it difficult to unscramble it. At first, some soldiers in the front line found themselves eating single items like canned prunes when they should have had a balanced diet, but they bore it cheerfully. We've learned a lot about the feeding of troops in modern mobile warfare. At any rate, foreign languages will never scramble our food again. What about food here in the British Isles, General? It's ample for our soldiers. Some people back home think we are not fed properly. The ration here is a little lower in weight, but there's plenty if none of it goes into the garbage can. And there's no need to send American soldiers over here in the food or clothing. I've had to write my wife a number of times about this. <laughs> that would be embarrassing to the quartermaster, wouldn't it, General? Thank you, sir. Now the signal corps. Communications hold the army together. Therefore, much of the signal service must be veiled in secrecy. But General Rumbo has consented to go as far as he can. One of our most difficult problems in preparing for North Africa was batteries. When all the units go into operations, they use their radio sets continuously, which means a heavy drain on dry cell batteries. Doorbell batteries, as we civilians would say. Yes. When orders for North Africa came to us in England, receipts of dry batteries were not at hand for the United States. We knew, we knew we would need many more than we had, or could get from home. The British promptly put several plants in 24-hour production. They made what we call Chinese copies. That is, near copies of American batteries. And did every unit get away completely equipped? Yes. The last shipment made the boats under officer convoy on the last day delivery was possible. And we were operating vast telephone and teleprint networks, and they did fine service. But probably our most essential message agency was a GHQ messenger service. They operated in daylight and darkness. They got their messages through. We were handling 100,000 messages a week in the emergency period before the convoys left. And that, I submit, is communication. Thank you, General Rumbo. Now the engineers. General Moore, this engineering end of fighting is a mystery to most of us. Can you explain, especially in relation to North Africa? Now here's the problem before North Africa, Mr. Beatty. We had to superimpose a large American force larger than our entire pre-war army on the British military plant. That meant adding new camps, new depots, shops, hospitals, complete airfields, and special air depots. We had to transform farmers' fields into military cities, including the public utilities. In addition, we took on the North African operation. There was no dodging it. If the engineers don't go, the army won't go. We assembled portable power plants and pipelines for oil and gas. We hurried the construction of airports and the complete concrete runways we're building on the aerial highway to Berlin. We poured enough concrete at one airport to build a trunk line highway from Washington to Baltimore. One of our delicate jobs is maps. If our soldiers had not had complete detailed maps of North Africa, they wouldn't have known where they were going. We reproduced and issued millions of secret maps. They were handled and sealed by officers only. One map in the enemy's hands might have given the entire operation away. And now we know, General, why if you engineers don't go, the Army won't go. Thank you. Next, the war machinery that interests mothers, wives, and sweethearts probably more than any other. The hospitals, the doctors, and all that goes with them. General Hawley, Chief Surgeon, is our man. General, I understand the North African campaign planning last July gave your corps much work. Yes, Mr. Beatty. Unfortunately, no entire complete hospital equipment had reached us here in Britain by last July. Several had arrived in pieces, and the parts were scattered all the way from base depots in the United States to ships at sea and to various arrival ports here. From the pieces of hospitals we had, 
and with the magnificent help of the British, we filled the hospital order for North Africa. All the equipment arrived there 99 and 5 tenths percent complete. That's a remarkable performance for our supply personnel. Many of these men had come out of filling stations and hamburger stands back home only a few months before, and therefore knew nothing at all about identifying the strange hospital items. Here in Britain, we've also taken some of the casualties from the North African theater. They've been comfortable all the way and cheerful, almost without exception. And here we've got fine American equipment, recognized everywhere as the best in the world and medical teams from great American institutions like Columbia, University of Michigan, Harvard, University of California, Syracuse, and Maine. Thank you, General Hawley. I know that American mothers appreciate the job you're doing. And now, the general commanding the services of supply in the European theater, a man already famous for helping to tame the Mississippi River in peacetime. He has now created the greatest arsenal of supply ever built by one nation upon the soil of another. Major General John C.H. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Beatty. My supply chiefs have given you people back home an informal, and I hope interesting picture, of some of the planning that preceded the Allied victory in North Africa. I would like to state quite clearly, however, the central planning that made it all possible was done in Washington and in London by our leaders, the combined chiefs of staff. Also, the brilliant execution of the overall plan was General Eisenhower's and the forces gathered around him in North Africa. In our own service sphere, General Somerville, in Washington, took the helm magnificently and provided the necessary services of supply to our armies destined for victory. I know that he is grateful, as we are, for the support all you Americans are getting us from home. The equipment and supplies you send us are superb. General Montgomery of the British 8th Army has wisely said that it is vital for a commanding officer to realize that his administration in rear must be commensurate with what he wants to achieve in front. He must also realize, and very clearly, that if such is not the case, he will very probably fail. We here in Britain are an administration in rear. We are operating the supply lines, which are the lifeblood of the forces receiving the sinews of war. The most brilliant soldier cannot carry out his design of battle unless we provide a smoothly working arsenal of battle machinery. Battle machinery in modern war is the most technical that man has ever known. Therefore, in my service command, there is no such thing as an unimportant assignment. The officers and men you folks back home have sent to the British Isles, no, they know that they're doing important work. Whether they're laying concrete for that aerial highway to Berlin, or whether they're cooking solid food for healthy soldiers. And we will deliver the goods. And I should pay tribute to these men, down to the privates in the field. It is literally true in the North African operations that the secret of great events was shared by thousands of officers and enlisted men in the United Kingdom. They did not know the details, or when or where we would strike but they knew enough so that the enemy might have pieced together our plan of battle if a single code word had been slipped. For three months, we maintained rigid silence. Hundreds of us, yes, thousands of us, toiled night and day. Some of the men who were working on secret maps at times went 76 hours without sleep, but they maintained silence. And that act alone contributed to victory. It helped keep war away from America's shores. At this moment, those same thousands of men and many more in these islands are engaged on even greater tasks. They're keeping greater secrets. They are preparing for the next blow against the enemy. They are preparing to help the high command plot the path of victory. They are getting ready to take some of the roads that President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill, there with him, have so aptly said, lead to Berlin, Rome, and Tokyo. Thank you, General Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just had the rare opportunity of hearing the military wing of democracy explain how it functions a long way from home. We've had another opportunity to compare our own people, our own leaders, with the leadership of the Axis state. There, especially in Germany, Hitler covers up all his general's hard work. He hides it from the eyes of the people. Then suddenly, presented to the Axis citizen, is a piece of black magic. The successes of the Germans in Europe at the start of this war were marked by the same kind of staff work 
the same kind of work by privates and generals as we have described to us today. But instead of explaining as far as possible how it was done, the Germans chose to make it look like a superhuman accomplishment and attribute it all to the some rare element of Nazism. As these American generals have explained to us, war is hard work, brains and organization and machines. Making these into teams produces efficient fighting forces, and we have them. And now this is May Morgan Beatty saying, so long until next Saturday. You have been listening to War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen from London by Morgan Beatty, NBC's veteran war observer in the British capital. This program has come to you from London and New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. This is Berlin Calling. Berlin calling the American mothers, wives, and sweethearts. And I'd just like to say, girls, that when Berlin calls, it pays to listen. When Berlin calls, it pays to listen in. Because there's an American girl sitting at the microphone every Tuesday evening at the same time with a few words of truth to her country women back home. Girls, you all know, of course, by now that it's a very serious situation and there must be some reason for my being here in Berlin. Some reason why I'm not sitting at home with you at the little sewing bees, knitting socks for our men over in French North Africa. Yes, girls, there is a reason. And it's this. It's because I'm not on the side of President Roosevelt. I'm not on the side of Roosevelt and his Jewish friends and his British friends. Because I've been brought up to be a 100% American girl. Conscious of everything American. Conscious of her friends, conscious of her enemies. And the enemies are precisely those people who are fighting against Germany today. And in case you don't know it, indirectly against America too. Because a defeat for Germany would mean a defeat for America. Believe me, it would be the very beginning of the end of America and all of its civilization. And that's why, girls, I'm staying over here and having these little heart-to-heart talks with you once a week. I know they're awfully short, and there's not much that one can say. But at least I'm so convinced that it's the truth, and I'm sure that truth will win. And besides that, you know, I'm in constant touch with your men over here, interned in Germany as prisoners of war. And I'm sure you'll be very happy to get some news of them from time to time. And I'll do my best to transmit that to you, just as often as I can. And now, girls, just last week, in speaking to one American boy, he told us then about the films which he had seen in America. Films which dealt with the barbarism of Germany and of the treatment which he deals out to American prisoners and all of that sort of thing. And that's why I'm just going to put all the energy I can into these few moments I have with you each week and try to get you to see the light of day and to let you realize that you're on the wrong side of the fence. And now, girls, I do think it would be nice to listen to a little music, don't you? The sort of music which conveys the thoughts which are in the hearts of your men over in French South Africa today, over there in the dry and hot desert. They're dreaming now of a lazy day at home, a lazy day when spring and summer meet, a lazy day when green fields are whispering of home sweet home. And now here it is, conveying all the thoughts in the hearts of those men so far away from their mothers and wives today. No longer lower me. The town just doesn't look as bad. Isn't it a darn shame? All the sweet old American summer atmosphere which the boys are missing now. Just imagine sitting out on the old uh, back porch in a sweet old rocking chair and listening to the birds at twilight. Instead of that, the boys are over there in the hot, sunny desert, longing for home, and for what? Fighting for our friends. Well, 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 since when are the British our friends? Now, girls, come on, be honest. As one American to another, do you love the British? Well, of course the answer is no. Do the British love us? Well, I should say not. But we are fighting for them. 
Are we not shedding our good young blood for this kite war, for this British war? Oh, girls, why don't you wake up? I mean, after all, the women can do something, can't they? I and mean, try to, to realize where the uh, situation is leading us to. Because it is the downfall of civilization if it goes on like that. After all, let the British get out of their own mess, girls. And let God save the king. If he's worthy of it, I'm sure God can. At least there's no reason for we Americans to get mixed up in double messes. Don't you agree with me? Well, girls, I'm sorry, but the time is really nearly up now. And just in closing, girls, I'd like to ask you one question on the level, straight from the shoulder. If your child behaves badly, do you agree with its misbehavior? Do you say to yourself, my child, right or wrong, I don't care what he does? No, you don't. You try to correct that child. You try to make him a better citizen. Well, and what is a country? A country is only made up of people, after all. Do you say, my country, right or wrong? No, girl. That's false sentimentality. And I do not say my country, right or wrong. I love America. But I do not love Roosevelt and all of his tight boyfriends who have thrown us into this awful turmoil. And I'll stick to my guns as long as I can fire them, girls. So you've not heard the last of me. And I'm sure that you'll not switch off your radio because you will want to hear more of what Berlin is saying through the medium of an American girl. And do you remember when you were a little girl, perhaps, and your father gave you a beating? Well, I mean, it did happen sometimes, didn't it? But not so very hard. And then father said to you, this hurts me more than it does you. Well, I remember father saying that to me once. And I looked up into his eyes when he said, this hurts me more than it does you. And I thought he was an awful person. But daddy only did it for my good. And girls, that's why I'm making life much harder for me than I need to make it by staying over here in Berlin and trying to give you the truth straight from my heart. Girls, watch out. Become America conscious. Don't forget the beautiful things we have at home, which are now in danger of being jeopardized by the Jewish and the British. Good night, girls. Right, Rosen, you are tuned in to the German Austin Service in Berlin, broadcasting to North America. There is the German Overseas Service in Berlin, broadcasting to North America over stations in the 19, 25, 28, 31, and 41 meter bands, which correspond to the 15, 11, 10, 9, and 7 mid-cycle bands. This is Berlin Calling. Berlin Calling, the American Mothers, Wives, and Sinclair. And I'd just like to say, girls, that when Berlin calls, it pays to listen. When Berlin calls, it pays to listen in. Because there's an American girl sitting at the microphone every Tuesday evening at the same time with a few words of truth to her country women back home. Girls, you all know, of course, by now that it's a very serious situation. And there must be some reason for my being here in Berlin. Some reason why I'm not sitting at home with you at the little sewing bees knitting socks for our men over in French North Africa. Yes, girls, there is a reason. And it's this. It's because I'm not on the side of President Roosevelt. I'm not on the side of Roosevelt and his Jewish friends and his British friends. Because I've been brought up to be a 100% American girl. Conscious of everything American. Conscious of her friends, conscious of her enemies. And the enemies are precisely those people who are fighting against Germany today, and in case you don't know it, indirectly against America too. Because a defeat for Germany would mean a defeat for America. Believe me, it would be the very beginning of the end of America and all of her civilization. And that's why, girls, I'm staying over here and having a little heart-to-heart talk with you once a week. I know they're awfully short, and there's not much that one can say. But at least I'm so convinced that it's the truth, and I'm sure that truth will win. And besides that, you know, I'm in constant touch with your men over here, in current in Germany as prisoners of war, 
and I'm sure you'll be very happy to get some news of them from time to time. And I'll do my best to transmit that to you, just as often as I can. And now there was just last week in speaking to one American boy. He told us then about the films which he had seen in America. Films which dealt with the barbarism of Germany and of the treatment which he deals out to American prisoners and all of that sort of thing. And that's why I'm just going to put all the energy I can into these few moments I have with you each week and try to get you to see the light of day and to let you realize that you're on the wrong side of the fence. And now, girls, I do think it would be nice to listen to a little music, don't you? The sort of music which conveys the thoughts which are in the hearts of your men over in French South Africa today. Over there in the dry and hot desert, they're dreaming now of a lazy day at home, a lazy day when spring and summer meet, a lazy day when green fields are whispering of home sweet home. And now here it is, conveying all the thoughts in the hearts of those men so far away from their mothers and wives today. No longer lower me. The town just doesn't look as bad. All the sweet old American summer atmosphere which the boys are missing now. Just imagine sitting out on the old uh, back porch in a sweet old rocking chair and listening to the birds at twilight. Instead of that, the boys are over there in the hot, sunny desert, longing for home and for what? Fighting for our friends. Well, 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 since when are the British our friends? Now, girls, come on, be honest. As one American to another, do you love the British? Well, of course, the answer is no. Do the British love us? Well, I should say not. But we are fighting for them. We are shedding our good young blood for this kite war, for this British war. Oh, girls, why don't you wake up? I mean, after all, the women can do something, can't they? So I will try to, to realize where the situation is leading us to. Because it is the downfall of civilization if it goes on like that. After all, let the British get out of their own mess, girls. And let God save the king. If he's worthy of it, I'm sure God can. At least there's no reason for we Americans to get mixed up in little messes. Don't you agree with me? Well, girls, I'm sorry that the time is really nearly up now. And just in closing, girls, I'd like to ask you one question on the level, straight from the shoulder. If your child behaves badly, do you agree with its misbehavior? Do you say to yourself, my child, right or wrong, I don't care what he does? No, you don't. You try to correct that child. You try to make him a better citizen. Well, and what is a country? A country is only made up of people, after all. Do you say, my country, right or wrong? No, girl. That's false sentimentality. And I do not say my country right or wrong. I love America, but I do not love Roosevelt and all of his tight boyfriends who have thrown us into this awful turmoil. And I'll stick to my guns as long as I can fire them, girls. So you've not heard the last of me, and I'm sure that you'll not switch off your radio because you will want to hear more of what Berlin is saying through the medium of an American girl. And do you remember when you were a little girl, perhaps, and your father gave you a beating? Well, I mean, it did happen sometimes, didn't it? But not so very hard. And then father said to you, this hurts me more than it does you. Well, I remember father saying that to me once. And I looked up into his eyes when he said, this hurts me more than it does you. And I thought he was an awful person. But daddy only did it for my good. And girls, that's why I'm making life much harder for me than I need to make it by staying over here in Berlin and trying to give you the truth straight from my heart. Girls, watch out. Become America conscious. Don't forget the beautiful things we have at home, which are now in danger of being jeopardized by the Jewish and the British. Good night, girls. 
Well, girls, I'm sorry, but the time is really nearly up now. And just in closing, girls, I'd like to ask you one question on the level, straight from the shoulder. If your child behaves badly, do you agree with its misbehavior? Do you say to yourself, my child, right or wrong, I don't care what he does? No, you don't. You try to correct that child. You try to make him a better citizen. Well, and what is a country? A country is only made up of people, after all. Do you say, my country, right or wrong? No, girl. That's false sentimentality. And I do not say my country right or wrong. I love America, but I do not love Roosevelt and all of his kite boyfriends who have thrown us into this awful turmoil. And I'll stick to my guns as long as I can fire them, girls. So you've not heard the last of me, and I'm sure that you'll not switch off your radio because you will want to hear more of what Berlin is saying through the medium of an American girl. Good night, girl. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, 17 months have passed since I last had the honor to address the Congress of the United States. For more than 500 days, every day a day, we have toiled and suffered and dared shoulder to shoulder against the cruel and mighty enemy. We have acted in close combination or concert in many parts of the world, on land, on sea, and in the air. The fact that you have invited me to come to Congress again a second time, now that uh, we have uh, settled down to the job, and that you should welcome me in so generous uh, a fashion, is uh, certainly a high mark. In my life, and uh, it also shows that our partnership has not done so badly. I am uh, I am proud that you should have found us good allies, striving forward in comradeship to the accomplishment of our task. Without grudging or stinting either life or treasure, or indeed anything we have to give. Last time I came at a moment when the United States was aflame with raw at the treacherous attack upon Pearl Harbor by Japan and at the subsequent declarations of war upon the United States made by Germany and Italy. For my part, I have say quite frankly, all in those days, after our long and for a whole year lonely struggle, I could not repress in my heart a sense of relief and comfort that we were all bound together by common peril, by solemn faith and high purpose to see this careful quarrel through at all costs to the end. That was an hour of passionate emotion, an hour most memorable in human record, an hour that I believe full of hope and glory for the future. The experiences of a long life and the promptings of my blood have wrought in me the conviction that there is nothing more important for the future of the world than the fraternal association of our two peoples in righteous work, both in war and peace. So in January 1942, I had that feeling 
of comfort. And I therefore prepared myself uh, in a confident and steadfast spirit to bear the terrible blows which were evidently about to fall on British interests in the Far East, which were bound to fall upon us from the military strength of Japan during a period when the American and British fleets had lost, for the time being, the naval command of the Pacific and Indian Ocean. One after another, in swift succession, very heavy misfortune fell upon us and upon our allies, the Dutch, in the Pacific Theatre. The Japanese have seized the lands and islands they so greedily coveted. The Philippines are enslaved. The lustrous, luxuriant regions of the Dutch East Indies have been overrun. In the Malay Peninsula and at Singapore, we ourselves suffered the greatest military disaster or at any rate, the largest military disaster in British history. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, all this has to be retrieved. And all this and much else has to be repaid. <laughs> and here, let me say, let no one suggest that we have, we British, <coughs> have not at least as great an interest as the United States in the unceasing and relentless waging of war against Japan. <laughs> and I am here to tell you that we will wage that war side by side with you, in accordance with the best strategic employment of our forces, while there is breath in our bodies and while blood flows in our veins. A, a notable part in the war against Japan must, of course, be played by the large armies and by the air and naval forces now marshaled by Great Britain on the eastern frontiers of India. In this quarter there lies one of the means of bringing aid to hard-pressed and long-tormented China. I regard the bringing of effective and immediate aid to China as one of the most urgent of our common tasks. <laughs> Uh, it, it may not have escaped your uh, attention that I have brought with me to this country and to this uh, conference Field Marshal Wavell and the other two commanders in chief from India. Now, they have not traveled all this way simply to concern themselves about improving the health and happiness of the Mikado of Japan. that all concerned in this uh, theatre should meet together and thrash out in friendly candor, heart to heart, all the points that arise. And there are many. You may be sure that if it was necessary, if all that was necessary was for an order to be given to the uh, great armies standing ready in India, uh, to march towards the rising sun and open the Burma Road, that order would be given this afternoon. The matter is, however, somewhat more complicated. <coughs> and all movements or infiltration of troops into the mountains and jungles to the northwest of India is very strictly governed by what your American military men call the science of logistics. <laughs> but, but, 
Mr. President, I repudiate, and I am sure with your sympathy, the slightest uh, suspicion that we should hold anything back that can be usefully employed, or that I and the government I represent are not as resolute to employ every man, gun, and airplane that can be used in this business and we have proved ourselves ready to do in other theaters of the war. In our conferences in January 1942, between the President and myself, and between our high expert advisors, it was evident that while the defeat of Japan would not mean the defeat of Germany, the defeat of Germany would infallibly mean the ruin of Japan. The realization of this simple truth does not mean that both sides could not proceed together. And indeed, the major part of the United States forces on, is now deployed on the Pacific front. In the broad division which we then made of our labors in January 1942, the United States undertook the main responsibility for prosecuting the war against the past and for aiding Australia and New Zealand to defend themselves against a Japanese invasion, which then seemed far more threatening than it does now. On the other hand, we took the main burden on the Atlantic, which was only natural. And thus the ocean lifeline which joins our two peoples can be kept unbroken the British Isles and all the very considerable forces which radiate therefrom would be paralyzed and doomed. We have willingly done our full share of the sea work in the dangerous waters of the Mediterranean and in the Arctic convoys to Russia, and we have sustained, since our alliance began, more than double the losses in merchant tonnage than has fallen upon the United States. <laughs> on the other hand, again, the prodigious output of new ships from the United States building yards has now, for um, six months past, overtaken and now far surpasses the losses of both allies. <laughs> And if no effort is relaxed, there is every reason to count upon a ceaseless, progressive expansion of Allied shipping available for the prosecution of the war. Our killings of the U-boats, uh, as the uh, Secretary of the Navy will uh, readily confirm, have this year greatly exceeded all previous experience. And the last three months, and particularly the last three weeks, have yielded record results. <laughs> uh, this, of course, is to some extent due to the larger numbers of U-boats operating. And that is also due to the marked improvement in the severity and uh, power of our measures against them and of the new devices continually employed. While I rate the new boat danger as still the greatest we have to face, I have a good and sober confidence that it will not only be met and contained, but overcome. The increase of shipping tonnage overseeing provides after the movement of vital supplies, the food and munitions have been arranged, provides that margin, which is the main measure of our joint war effort. We are also conducting from the British Isles the principal air offensive against Germany. <coughs> 
and in this we are powerfully aided by the United States Air Force in the United Kingdom, whose action is chiefly by day as ours is chiefly by night. In this war, numbers count more and more, both in night and day attacks. The saturation of the enemy's flak through the multiplicity of attacking planes, the division and dispersion of his fighter protection by the launching of several simultaneous attacks, are rewards which will immediately be paid to the substantial increases in British and American numbers which are now taking place. There is no doubt that the Allies already vastly outnumber the hostile air forces of Germany, Italy, and Japan. And still more does their output of new planes surpass the output of the enemy. In this air war, by which both Germany and Japan fondly imagined they would strike decisive and final blows, and terrorize nations great and small into submission to their will. In this our war, it is that these guilty nations have already begun to show their first real mortal weakness. The more continuous and severe the air fighting becomes, the better for us. Because we can already replace casualties and machines far more rapidly than the enemy, and we can replace them on a scale in a few pieces month by month. Progress in this sphere is swift and sure. But it must be remembered that the preparation and development of air and the movement of the great mass of ground personnel on whom the efficiency of modern air squadron depends, however earnestly pressed forward, is bound to take time. Opinion, Mr. President, is divided <coughs> as to whether the use of air power could by itself bring about a collapse in Germany or Italy. The experiment is well worth trying, so long as other measures are not excluded. Well, there's certainly no harm in finding out. But, but however that may be, anyhow we are all agreed that the damage done to the enemy's war potential is enormous. The condition to which the great centers of German war industry, and uh, particularly the Ruhr, are being reduced is one of unparalleled devastation. You have just read of the destruction of the great dams, which feed the canals and provide power to the enemy munition works. That was a gallant operation costing eight out of the 19 Lancaster bombers employed. But uh, it will uh, play uh, a very far-reaching part in German munition output. <laughs> it is our settled policy, the settled policy of our two staff and war-making authorities, to make it impossible for Germany to carry on any form of war industry on a large or concentrated scale, either in Germany, in Italy, or in the enemy-occupied countries. Yes. Wherever these centers exist or are developed, they will be destroyed and the munitions populations will be dispersed. They don't like what's coming to them, well, they let them disperse beforehand on their own. This process will continue ceaselessly with ever increasing weight and intensity until the German and Italian people abandon or destroy the monstrous tyranny which they have incubated and reared in their midst. <coughs> Meanwhile, our air offensive 
in forcing Germany to withdraw an ever larger proportion of its war-making capacity from the fighting front in order to provide protection against the air attack. Hundreds of fighter aircraft, thousands of anti-aircraft cannons, and many hundreds of thousands of men, together with a vast share in the output of the war factory, have already been assigned to this purely defensive country. <coughs> All this is at the expense of the enemy's power of new aggression, or of the, the enemy's power to resume the uh, initiative. Surveying the whole aspect of the air war, we cannot doubt that it is a major factor in the process of victory. Uh, that, I, I think, is established as a solid fact. <coughs> uh, it is all agreed between us that we should, at the earliest moment, similarly bring our joint air power to bear upon the military targets in the homelands of Japan. <laughs> The cold-blooded execution of United States airmen by the Japanese government is a proof not only of their barbarism, but of the dread with which they regard this possibility. It is the duty of those who are charged with the direction of the war to overcome at the earliest moment the military, geographical, and political difficulties and begin the process so necessary and desirable of laying the cities and other munition centers of Japan in ashes, for in ashes they must surely lie before peace comes back to the world. Uh, that this objective uh, holds a high place in the present the conference is obvious to these men. But no public discussion would be useful upon the method or sequence of events which should be pursued in order to achieve it. Uh, let me make it plain, however, that the British will participate in this air attack on Japan in harmonious accord with the major strategy of the war. That is our uh, desire and uh, the creatives of the Japanese enemy will make our airmen all the more ready to share the perils and sufferings of their American comrades. At the present time, uh, at the present time, speaking more generally, <coughs> the prime problem which is before the United States and to a lesser extent before Great Britain is not so much the creation of armies or the vast output of munitions and aircraft. These are already in full swing. An immense progress, prodigious results, have been achieved. The problem is rather the application of those forces to the enemy in the teeth of U-boat resistance across the great ocean spaces, across the narrow seas, or on land through the swamps, mountains, and jungles in various quarters of the globe. That is our problem. All our war plans must therefore be inspired, pervaded, and even dominated by the supreme object of coming to grips with the enemy under favorable conditions, or very really tolerable conditions, for we cannot pick and choose too much, on the largest possible scale, at the earliest possible moment, and of engaging that enemy wherever it is profitable, and indeed, I might say, wherever it is possible to do so. Thus, in this way, shall we make our enemies in Europe and in Asia burn and consume their strength on land, on sea, and in the air with the maximum rapidity. Now you will readily understand that the complex task 
of finding the maximum opening for the employment of our vast forces, the selection of the point at which to strike with the greatest advantage to those forces, and the emphasis and priority to be assigned to all the various enterprises which are desirable, but that is a task requiring the constant supervision and adjustment of our combined staff and of the head of government. This is a, a vast, complicated process, especially when two countries are involved directly in council together and when the interests of so many other countries have to be considered. And the utmost goodwill and readiness to think for the common cause, the cause of all the United Nations, is required from everyone participating in our discussion. The intricate adjustments and arrangements can only be made by discussion between men who know all the facts and who are and can be held accountable for success or failure. Lots of people can make good plans for winning the war if they have not got to carry them out. I dare say, I dare say, I dare say if I had not been uh, in a responsible position, I should have made a lot of excellent plans and very likely, and very likely should have brought them in one way or another to the notice of the executive authorities. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it is not uh, possible. It is not possible uh, to have uh, full open arguments about these matters, uh, and that is an additional hardship to those in charge. That the question cannot be argued out and debated in public, except with enormous reticency, and even then with very great danger that the watching and listening enemy may derive some profit from what he overhears. Uh, in these circumstances, in my opinion, I give you my opinion, the American and British press and public have treated their executive authorities with a wise and uh, indulgent consideration. And recent events have, I think, vindicated their self-restraint. Mr. President, it is thus that we are able to meet here today in all faithfulness, sincerity, and friendship. Geography imposes insuperable obstacles to the continuous session of the combined staff and executive chief. But as the scene is constantly changing, uh, and lately I think I may say constantly changing for the better, mm -hmm. repeated uh, conferences are indispensable if the sacrificing of the fighting troops are to be rendered fruitful, and if the curse of war which now lies so heavily upon almost the whole world is to be broken and swept away within the shortest possible time. I therefore thought it my duty, with the full authority of His Majesty's government, to come here again with our highest officers in order that the combined staff may work in the closest contact with the chief executive power which the president derives from his office and in respect of which I am the accredited representative of cabinet and parliament. The wisdom, Mr. President, the wisdom of the founders of the American Constitution led them to associate the office of Commander-in-Chief with that of the Presidency of the United States. In this they were following the precedents which were successful in the case of George Washington. It is remarkable <coughs> that after more than 150 years, this combination of political and uh, military authority has been, found, has been found necessary not only in the United States, but in the case of Marshal Stalin in Russia and of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek in China. He is an 
as uh, majority leader in the House of Commons, in one branch of the legislature, ha have been drawn from time to time, not perhaps wholly against my will, <laughs> in, in, into some participation in military affairs. <laughs> Modern, modern war is total, and it is necessary for its conduct that the technical and professional authorities should be sustained and, if necessary, directed by the heads of government who have the knowledge which enables them to comprehend not only the military but the political and economic forces at work and who have the power to focus them all upon the goal. These are the reasons which compelled the President to make his long journey to Casablanca, and these are the reasons which bring me here. We both of us earnestly hope that at no distant date we may be able to achieve what we have so long sought, namely a meeting with Marshal Stalin, and if possible with Generalissimo Chiang kai -shek. But how, when, and where this is to be accomplished is not a matter upon which I am able to shed any clear ray of light at the present time. And if I were, I should certainly not shed it. <laughs> um, in the meanwhile, we do our best to keep the closest association at every level between all the authorities of all the countries who are engaged in the, in the active direction of the war. And it is my special duty to promote and preserve this intimacy, intimacy and concept between all parts of the British Commonwealth and Empire, and especially with the great self-governing dominions like uh, Canada, whose Prime Minister is with us at this moment, whose contribution is so massive and invaluable. There could be no better or more encouraging example of the fruits of our consultations than the campaign in Northwest Africa, which has just ended so well. <laughs> One morning in June last, when I was here, the President handed me a strip of paper which bore the unexpected, utterly unexpected news of the uh, fall of Tobruk and the surrender of its garrison in unexplained circumstances, it, the surrender of its garrison of 25,000 men. That indeed was a dark and bitter hour for me, but I shall never forget the kindness, the delicacy, the true comradeship which our American friends showed me and those with me in such adversity. Their only thought was to find means of helping to restore the situation, and never for a moment did they question the resolution or the fighting quality of our troops. Hundreds of Sherman tanks were taken from the hands of American divisions and sent at the utmost speed round the Cape of Good Hope to Egypt. When one ship carrying 50 tanks was sunk by torpedo, the United States government replaced it and its precious vehicles before we could even think of asking them to do so. The, uh, the Sherman tank was the best tank in the desert in the year 1942, and the presence of these weapons played an appreciable part in the ruin of Rommel's army at the Battle of Alamein and in the long pursuit which chased him back to Tunisia. Well, at this time, June of last year, June 1942, when I was here last, at this time also, there lighted up those trains of thought and study which produced the memorable American and British descent of the French Northwest Africa, the results of which are a cause of general rejoicing today. We have certainly a most uh, 
encouraging example here of, of what can be achieved by British and Americans working together heart in hand. In fact, one might almost feel that if they could keep it up, there is hardly anything they could not do, either in the field of war or in the not less tangled problem of peace. The history will acclaim this uh, great enterprise as a classic example of the way to make war. We used the weapon of sea power, the weapon in which we were strongest, to attack the enemy at our chosen moment and at our chosen point. In spite of the immense elaboration of the plan and the many hundreds, thousands even, who had to be informed of its main outlines, we maintained secrecy and effective surprise. We confronted the enemy with a situation in which he had either to lose invaluable strategic territories or to fight under conditions most costly and wasteful to him. We recovered the initiative which we still retain. We rallied to our side French forces which are already a brave and will presently become a powerful army under the gallant <laughs> under the gallant General Zero. We are secure bases from which violent attacks can and will be delivered by our air power on the whole of Italy, with results which no one can measure, but which must certainly be highly beneficial to our affairs. We have made an economy in our strained and straitened shipping position worth several hundreds of great ships, and one which will give us the advantage of far swifter passage through the Mediterranean to the East, to the Middle East, and to the Far East. We have struck the enemy a blow which is the equal of Stalingrad and most stimulating to our heroic and heavily engaged Russian allies. And all this, Mr. President, gives the lie to the Nazi and fascist taunt that parliamentary democracies are incapable of waging effective war. Presently, we shall furnish them with further examples. <laughs> Still, I am free to admit that in uh, North Africa, we built it better than we knew. The unexpected came to the aid of the design and multiplied the results. For this, we have to thank the military intuition of Corporal Hitler. We, uh, we may notice, as I predicted in the House of Commons three months ago, the touch of the master hand. The same insensate obstinacy which condemned Field Marshal von Paulus and his army to the destruction of Stalingrad has brought this new catastrophe upon our enemies in Tunisia. We have destroyed or captured considerably more than a quarter of a million of the enemy's best troops, together with vast masses of material, all of which had been ferried across to Africa after paying a heavy toll to the British submarines and to British and United States aircraft. No one could count on such folly. Uh, they gave us, if I may use the language of finance, a handsome bonus after the full dividend had been earned and paid. <laughs> now, at the time when we planned this great uh, joint African operation, we hoped to be masters of Tunisia even before the end of last year. But the in injury we have now inflicted upon the enemy, physical and psychological, and the training our troops have obtained in the hard school of war, and the welding together of the Anglo-American staff machine, these are advantages which far exceed anything which it was within our power to plan. The, the German lie factory is volubly explaining 
how valuable is the time which they bought by the loss of their great army. Let them not delude themselves. Are there operations which will in unfold in due course? Depending as they did upon the special instruction of large numbers of troops and upon the provision of a vast mass of technical apparatus, these other operations have not been in any way delayed by the obstinate fighting in northern Tunisia. Mr. President, the African war is over. Mussolini's African empire and Corporal Hitler's strategy are alike exploded. It is interesting to compute what these performances have cost these two wicked men and those who have been their tools or their duties. The Emperor of Abyssinia sits again upon the throne from which he was driven by Mussolini's poison gas. All the vast territories from Madagascar to Morocco, from Cairo to Casablanca, from Aden to Dakar, are under British, American, or French control. One continent, at least, has been cleansed and spared forever from fascist or Nazi tyranny. The African excursions of the two dictators across their countries in killed and captured 950,000 soldiers. In addition, nearly 2,400,000 gross tons of shipping have been sunk and nearly 8,000 aircraft destroyed. Most of these figures being exclusive of large numbers of ships and aircraft damage. There have also uh, been lost to the enemy 6,200 guns and 2,550 tanks and 70,000 trucks, which is the American name for lorry. Uh, and which I understand, uh, and which I understand has been uh, adopted by the, uh, by the uh, combined staffs in uh, Northwest Africa in exchange for the use of the word petrol in the place of gasoline. Uh, at, these are the losses of the enemy in these three years of war. And, in the end of it, and at the end of it all, what is it that they have to say? The proud German army has, has by its sudden collapse, sudden crumpling and breaking up, unexpected uh, to all of us, the proud German army has once again proved the truth of the saying, the Hun is always uh, either at your throat or your feet. And, and, that is a, and that is a point which may have its bearing upon the future. But uh, for us, we can say, at this stage, arrived at this milestone in the war, we can say, one continent redeemed. <laughs> the Northwest African campaign, and particularly its Tunisian climax, is the finest example of the cooperation of the troops of three different countries and of the combination under one supreme commander of the sea, land, and air forces which has yet been seen. In particular, the British and American staff work, as I have said, has matched the comradeship of the soldiers of both our countries, striving forward side by side under the fire of the enemy. It was a marvel of efficient organization which enabled the second American Corps or rather army, for that was its size, to be moved 300 miles from the southern sector, which had become obsolete through the retreat of the enemy, to the northern coast, from which, beating down all opposition, they advanced and took the fortress and harbor of Bizerta. <laughs> In order to accomplish this march of 300 miles, 
which was covered in 12 days, it was necessary for this very considerable army with its immense modern uh, equipment to traverse at right angles all the communications of the British First Army which was already engaged or about to be engaged in heavy battle. And was, it was able, it, it, this was achieved without in any way disturbing the hour to hour supply upon which that army depended. I'm told that these British and American officers worked together without the slightest question of what country they belonged to. Each doing his part in military organization which uh, must henceforward be regarded as the most powerful and efficient instrument of war. There is honor, there is honor, Mr. President, for all. And I shall at the proper time and place pay my tribute to the British and American commanders by land and sea who conducted or who were engaged in the battle. This only will I say now. I do not think you could have chosen uh, any man more capable than General Eisenhower. <laughs> of keeping his very large heterogeneous force together through bad times as well as good, and of creating the conditions of harmony and energy which were the indispensable elements of victory. I have dwelt in some detail, uh, but I, I trust not at undue length, upon these famous events, and I shall now return to the general war for a few minutes, in which they have their setting and proportion. Uh, it is a poor heart that never rejoices, but our thanksgiving, however fervent, must be brief. Heavier work lies ahead, not only in the European, but as I have indicated, in the Pacific and Indian spheres. And the President and I and the combined staff are gathered here in order that this work shall be, so far as lies within us, well conceived and thrust forward without losing a day. Not for one moment must we forget that the main burden of the war on land is still being borne by the Russian army. They are holding at the present time no fewer than 190 German divisions and 28 satellite divisions on their front. It is always wise while doing justice to one's own achievement to preserve a proper sense of proportion. And I therefore mention that these figures of the German forces opposite to Russia compared, compare with the equivalent of about 15 divisions which we have destroyed in Tunisia after a campaign with about 50,000 casualties. That gives some measure of the Russian effort and of the debt which we owe to her. It may well be that a further trial of strength between the German and Russian armies is impending. Russia has already inflicted injuries upon the German military organism, which will, I believe, prove ultimately mortal. But there is little doubt that Hitler is reserving his supreme gambler's throw for a third attempt to break the heart and spirit and destroy the armed forces of the mighty nation which he has already twice assaulted in vain. He will not succeed. But we must do everything in our power that is sensible and practical to take more of the weight off Russia in 1943. I, uh, I do not intend to be responsible for any suggestion that the war is won or that it will soon be over. That it will be won by us, I am sure.
But how and when cannot be foreseen, still less foretold. I was driving the other day, not far from the field of Gettysburg, which I know well, like most of your battlefields. It was the decisive battle of the, of the Civil War. No one after Gettysburg doubted which way the dread balance of war would incline. Yet far more blood was shed after the Union victory at Gettysburg than in all the fighting which went before. It behoves us, therefore, to search our hearts and brace our sinews and take the most earnest counsel one with another in order that the favorable position which has already been reached both against Japan and against Hitler and Mussolini in Europe shall not be let slip. If we wish to abridge the slaughter and ruin which this war is spreading to so many lands and to which we must ourselves contribute so grievous a measure of suffering and sacrifice, we cannot afford to relax a single fiber of our being or to tolerate the slightest abatement of our effort. The enemy is still proud and powerful. He is hard to get at. He still possesses enormous armies, vast resources, and invaluable strategic territory. War is full of mysteries and surprises. A false step, a wrong direction of strategic effort, discord or lassitude among the Allies might soon give the common enemy the power to confront us with new and hideous facts. We have surmounted many serious dangers. But there is one great danger which will go along with us till the end. That danger is the undue prolongation of the war. No one can tell what new complications and perils might arise in four or five more years of war. And it is in the dragging out of war at enormous expense till the democracies are tired or bored or split that the main hopes of Germany and Japan must now reside. We must destroy this hope as we have destroyed so many others. And for that purpose, we must beware of every topic, however attractive, and every tendency, however natural, which turns our minds or energies from the supreme objective of the general victory of the United Nations. By singleness of purpose, by steadfastness of conduct, by tenacity and endurance, such as we have so far displayed, by these, and only by these, can we discharge our duty to the future of the world and to the destiny of man. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battle fronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. These are the latest developments. Japanese bombers have made an unsuccessful attack on American warships off Attu and the Aleutians. In the Mediterranean, Allied planes have continued their nonstop bombings of Axis airfields in Sicily and Italy. On the Russian front... The Red Army has repulsed new German attacks in the Donetsk region. And in Moscow, American envoy Joseph E. Davies is waiting for another call to the Kremlin to receive Stalin's reply to President Roosevelt's letter. Now, for our first broadcast from overseas, Admiral Radio takes you direct to CBS London. Bob Trout reporting. London. All week long, the air war against the Germans was waged in strength from this island base. But this weekend, the heavy United Nations air blows against the Axis are being struck by the Mediterranean Air Command. Last night, Royal Air Force Bomber Command's aircraft remained on the ground here in Britain, although fighter command planes were out, and there were no enemy planes over this country. Today, it was fine and sunny in the Straits of Dover, and at times noisy as the Allied planes flew out. Before we'd had word of their return, nine German FW-190s made a typical hit-and-run raid on the southeast coast town. 
roaring in suddenly from rooftop height, dropping bombs, swinging around, roaring back out over the water, machine gunning the streets as they streak back toward enemy territory across the channel. That's the way these hit-and-run raids are made. And sometimes casualties are heavy, for if people are not caught in their homes by bombs, they may be caught in the streets by machine gun and cannon fire. In today's raid, the streets happen to be nearly empty of people. Not only that, but one-third of the enemy raiders were destroyed, so this Sunday was not a very good day for the German sneak raiders. And while this was going on, Royal Air Force Venturas, escorted by Spitfires, were bombing the Coke ovens at Zeebrugge in Belgium. All the British planes returned safely. General Catru, of the fighting French mission in Algiers, reached London late last night, and this morning he conferred with General de Gaulle. This evening, we learned that Harold Macmillan, the British minister resident at Allied headquarters in North Africa, has also returned to London. Tomorrow, the French National Committee will meet. The text of General Giraud's latest letter to General de Gaulle was made public here this evening, and in it, General Giraud says, the time has come for immediate joint action for union. The way to achieve union, General Giraud's letter says, is to form at once a central executive committee to meet at Algiers. At the moment, I am not able to recall the exact number of Italians captured by the various branches of the British Armed Forces, but, of course, the number is way up in the thousands. Late this afternoon, two Italians were captured. They had escaped from their prison camp in Britain, and their capture is credited to the South Devonshire Constabulary. And now back to CBS New York and Doug Edwards. More news in just a moment, but first, here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Today, Admiral brings you another interesting story about radar. The day will soon come when American bombers can take off from combat bases and wing their way in far greater safety toward enemy targets thanks to radar. Planes equipped with ordinary altimeters face the constant hazard of crashing into unseen mountain peaks because an ordinary altimeter simply indicates the height above sea level, not the distance between plane and ground. Such an altimeter might register 5,000 feet above sea level, utterly ignoring a mountain peak towering 10,000 feet into the sky. Soon, however, American pilots will be free from such dangers, just as quickly as American planes can be equipped with radar, radar that is today being built by Admiral. Because radar will tell American pilots the actual distance between their planes and the ground immediately below. Even the slightest variation in terrain will be instantly and accurately registered. In building radar, Admiral will not only help save the lives of American fighters today, but contribute much to the future success of aviation. For when peace comes, radar will be instrumental in making commercial aviation safer than ever. In just a few minutes, Admiral will tell you how radar gets its name. But first, here's Doug Edwards with more news. As we said earlier, Allied planes have kept up their systematic onslaught against Italian and Sicilian air bases. Yesterday, 17 more Axis planes were destroyed in the air and on the ground. But now, for a direct report on the latest developments in that Mediterranean war zone, which may become an invasion war zone, Admiral Radio takes you direct to CBS Algiers, Winston Burdett reporting. Now that the battle of North Africa has ended, political affairs are back in the headlines again in Algiers. The French papers today are full of reports about the expected accord between General Giraud and General de Gaulle, the accord which should bring about the union of fighting Frenchmen. They published the text of de Gaulle's latest statement, which appeared in other capitals three days ago. And the mere fact that they are now publishing what de Gaulle has to say seems a good sign. It looks as though the long-awaited agreement between the front leaders, if it is going to be reached at all, will be reached very soon now. The negotiations between the two generals have been long and difficult. If it had been just a military matter, things might have been settled long ago. But the essential differences were political differences, and the fundamental trouble all the way through was that Vichy had left a very strong heritage in North Africa. The government of Vichy left a mass of oppressive racial and social legislation. It left a number of fascist-inspired organizations, like the Legion of Former Fighters. It left many people in high places who did not wish to go to come here. 
men in the army who were sent here by the German-Italian Armistice Commission, men in the, in the administration who were Vichy's friends, but not ours. Well, over a period of months, the political scene has changed considerably, and North Africa has become a better place to live in. The Vichy racial laws have been abolished. The others have been or are being drastically revised. During the past week, the so-called Vichy Charter of Labor was abrogated, and trade unions are now free to organize in accordance with French Republican law. The Legion of Former Fighters and other fascist associations have been dissolved. As for the pro-Vichy characters who remain on the scene, it is tacitly understood that when and if the goal comes, many of them will have to go. So the negotiations between the generals have already produced results in North Africa, good results which, which have represented a moral victory for the goal, since it was he who insisted on the restoration of Republican law and on the dissolution of Vichy organization. The heritage left by the Pétain Laval government is being slowly rooted out. It is not entirely rooted out yet. There are still men here who pay lip service to democracy, but who have quite other ideas for France. And that is why the coming of the girl would have such great importance. It would help to kill Vichy in North Africa and to ensure that nothing like Vichy happens again in France. That North Africa, returning you to CBS in New York. The Russian battlefronts are still comparatively quiet, but for all dispatches, stress the fact that both sides are reported for big offensives. For a direct report, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Moscow, Bill Downs reporting. Former Ambassador Joseph Davies has yet has not received an answer from Mr. Stalin to President Roosevelt's letter. For the past two weeks, I, the other correspondent here in Moscow, have been telling you to expect heavy fighting this spring and summer on the Russian front. The Russian press and Soviet military leaders have been telling the people of this country the same thing. That fighting has failed to materialize. Although you might be getting mighty tired of hearing of it, I want to repeat. There is every indication that the Red Army may have to undergo its supreme test in the next 20 weeks. You remember Winston Churchill in his speech to the American Congress the other day called it Hitler's Supreme Gambler's Show. The Fuhrer has picked up the dice of destiny and he's rattling them, but he's hesitating about throwing them out. This year's spring fighting already is ten days behind the schedule set by the start of last year's hostility. Last year it was the Red Army who made the first toss. On May 13th of last year, Marshal Timoshenko led an offensive in the direction of Kharkov. A year ago today, the Russian communique spoke of the Red Army fortifying its gains in the Kharkov direction. It also announced that 15,000 Germans were killed in three days fighting on the middle reaches of the Donetsk River. Today, the story is much different. There is only local scouting and artillery skirmishing. There are many reasons for the delay in the summer fighting, reasons which grow out of the tremendous sacrifices which both the Germans and the Russians suffered in last winter's fighting. We are told it is almost a certainty that Hitler will start the fighting this spring. But he is hesitating because this time he feels he must not fail. He must get this campaign rolling before he has to organize another to protect his European fortress from a second front. Yes, Adolf Hitler has just about completed placing his bets on the Russian front. And the Red Army is covering all of them. And this is Bill Downs returning you now to CBS in New York. Here in our New York studio are two American war correspondents who spent many months together in Russia, in Moscow, and on the battlefronts. Walter Kerr, New York Herald Tribune correspondent, has just returned from Moscow. CBS correspondent Larry Lesseur preceded him home. They are ready to give you their views based on long observations inside the Soviet Union of what the dissolution of the Communist International really means. Larry Lesseur, suppose you lead off. Well, there's no more interesting story in the world today than the dissolution of the Communist International. Interesting not only to us Americans, but to the peoples of conquered Europe, to Hitler and his allies, and to the people of Russia. I know that this afternoon men are whispering about it on the street corners of Paris, in the cafes of Berlin, and near the red walls of the Kremlin in distant Moscow. 
I'd like to ask Walter Kerr what he thinks the Russians are saying about it this afternoon. What's your opinion, Walter? Well, Larry, I'm sure that right now men and women are talking about this near Pushkin Square, in Gorky Street, in Moscow's famed subway, out in the park of culture and rest, and probably at the ballet between the acts. I think you will agree with me that they are glad to hear about the dissolution of the Communist International. The people of Moscow are tired of that sort of thing. They're fighting a hard war. They are interested only in winning that war, in rebuilding their homes, and after the defeat of the Axis, to live their lives in peace. Walter, I don't remember hearing anything about common turn while I was in Moscow. Did you? Very little, Larry. In fact, every Russian I talked to told me the International was dead and that it had been for a long time. Only once in the 18 months I was there did I see it mentioned in the newspapers, and that was a one-paragraph item which said the Comintern's office workers had contributed a little money to the Russian defense fund. A lot of people here are wondering whether this dissolution of the Comintern is just a tactical move designed to last only for the duration of the war. Perhaps it's too early to tell now, but anyway, Walter, dissolution of the International removes one of the great obstacles to complete cooperation between the United Nations. Furthermore, it weakens the Axis nations, which are bound together by the anti-common turn pact. Now there's a pact, but there's no common turn, so the pact stands for nothing. I think there'll be a decided reaction in conquered Europe. Hitler's propaganda line, Larry, is that he is protecting the people of Europe from international communism. But now the communist parties in enslaved Europe have been instructed to work with and to support, through the underground movement, their legally constituted governments in exile. And so it seems that Hitler's propaganda line has lost any possible significance. Well, today Hitler is still trying to claim that dissolution of the common turn means nothing. And that he's still the protector of Europe, saving it from Bolshevism. We know differently that Moscow's abandonment of world revolution will have a great effect in strengthening the United Nations uh, during this great battle for their existence. It looks to me like just another nail driven into the Axis coffin. Yes, I think you're right. And Hitler will find this out just as soon as the communist underground members in Europe start to work in complete harmony with the other political parties of enslaved Europe. Larry, what do you think the effect of all this will be in America? Well, the Communist Party is not just a phrase. It's an organization of people. People who are fervent disciples of an economic religion. They, of course, will continue to be such. The Communist Party of America will continue to exist, but as a unit in itself and not as a part of a worldwide organization. If the dissolution means what Moscow has said it means, American communists will work without directives from Moscow, and they'll support our American form of government until Hitler goes down in defeat. I think, Larry, that the Comintern has been more of a hindrance than a help to the Soviet Union in wartime. So the Comintern is out. Yes, and my guess is that Stalin is glad to trade his Comintern for a second front in Europe. And now, here in our New York studio, is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Yielding Elliott. There is every evidence that the Italian Air Force is dwindling away rapidly, both in numbers and in spirit. During the last four days, no less than 305 Axis aircraft have been destroyed by Allied raids on Sicily, Sardinia, and southern Italy, with very small losses of Allied planes. Many of these Axis aircraft were destroyed on the ground. Some of the planes destroyed have been German, but the majority were Italian. Since the total first-line operating strength of the Italian Air Force was not much over a thousand combat-type planes at the beginning of the last phase of the Tunisian operations, there is a strong likelihood that the much-vaunted air power of Benito Mussolini is moving toward the vanishing point. As for the German Luftwaffe, there is not much prospect that it will send many of its fighters to defend Italy when these fighters are so badly needed at home to protect the vital centers of Germany itself. German fighter strength is being concentrated in Western Germany under the pressure of a terrible necessity. And this is being done at a time when Germany is preparing for a great stroke on the Russian front, a forlorn hope on which all the little remaining chance of German military success in this war is being staked. One can imagine the pressure being put on the high command by the German army commanders in Russia for more air power and more air power to protect their communications and storage dumps from the Red Air Force, which is raiding them by day and by night. Under these conditions, there is not much likelihood of any strong German air power being told off to protect Italy. Sicily and Sardinia seem to be undergoing a systematic softening up process, which may very well be the preliminary to invasion. It remains to be seen whether the Italian army 
will fight any better in defense of its native soil than it has fought in other theaters of war. Across the Pacific, CBS correspondent is standing by to bring you an interview with one of our flyers who took part in the recent raid on Wake Island. For this and the latest Pacific news, Admiral Radio takes you after a brief pause to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. Hot activity continued at both ends of the long Pacific front this weekend with the Americans mopping up on the Aleutian Island of Attu on one end and a continued pounding of the air war on Jap bases by Allied bombers and fighters at the other end in the Solomons and New Guinea. While the run to Wake Island hasn't quite become the milk route, the United States Army bombers have bombed Wake five separate times. You've heard of the success of these bombing operations, the most recent of which was a week ago, when 24,000 pounds of high-explosive bombs were dropped successfully on Jap supplies, materials, and installations. With me here is Staff Sergeant John H. Allen of Lowell, Massachusetts, gunner on a four-motored B-24 Liberator bomber. He was one of the men on that raid. Uh, Sergeant, uh, tell us, where's your gun located? It's the belly gun on the ready teddy. Some folks think a belly gunner is a man who stretches out on his stomach to shoot, but it's just the name of the gunner we call, uh, uh, the gunner who fires the belly of a uh, bomber. Well, what's the uh, ready teddy crew? Oh, that's the name of our bomber, the ready teddy. We got a picture of the teddy bear dropping a bomb down on Tokyo painted on it. Well, tell us about this uh, raid on Wake. We were in a squadron commanded by Major Dan of Billings. I was in a plane he was piloting with Lieutenant Raymond Henderson as co-pilot. We also carried Colonel Clarence F. Heggie, who commanded the entire flight. He's only 36 years old, too. Our navigator, Lieutenant John Bridge, got us there right on. And our bombardier, Lieutenant Howard Baysmore, got our bomb squarely on the target. The weather was cloudy. And he took us over the target four times to get them right on. Did you see them hit? Yes, I happened to see them land, and right on the button they were, too. Right away, though, I got too busy to, for much sightseeing. Sightseeing, because uh, we ran into Jap Zero fighters, and all the guns got too busy. Tech Sergeant John Padone was right in the waist. I was in the belly. Staff Sergeant Louis Alexander was in the tail, and Staff Sergeant Ralph Eden was in the turret above. And once Lieutenant Bridge navigated us there, he got on the gun, too. Tech Sergeant John Cotton was making pe uh, taking pictures of the bombing for the record. And Colonel Heggie surprised us, surprised us by grabbing a gun and firing away. He's a good shot, too. That's what I hear. Say, uh, how many zeros were there in all? About 20. Ten or 12 were flying around us, holding off at first. I don't think they like to mix it, mix it with us unless we're... They can gang up on a lone opponent. Pretty soon, they started coming in. We kept right on going, though. I was following those zeros pretty close. And our whole crew of gunners were getting in some good shots. Then I got a bead right on one and let them have it. I could see some of Jack Pannon's bursts going into them at the same time. All of a sudden, the Jap flew into pieces. Well, how do you feel about getting your first Jap zero, Sergeant? Well, that isn't the way we figure it. That plane was shot down by the Ready Teddy crew. There were several bullets from several guns in them. Whatever we do, we do as a crew, and the crew gets the credit. We share the works in the bomber. Well, Sergeant, your father, John F. Allen, is back there in Lowell, Massachusetts, isn't he? Yes, he is. He lives there alone now. Well, what's his uh, occupation? Since I got in the Air Corps, he works in a parachute factory. Making parachutes. He makes parachutes. Well, John, here's hoping you and the Ready Teddy crew and your new squadron commander, Captain Alan H. Wood, never have need for any of his parachutes. We've interviewed Staff Sergeant John H. Allen, gunner on the good ship Ready Teddy, a B-24 four-motored Liberator bomber on last week's Wake Island raid. This is Wobbly Edwards in Honolulu, returning you to CBS in New York. Next, for developments here at home, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Washington. Lee White reporting. There has been no change in the situation on At Two. A brief Navy communique this afternoon reported an unsuccessful Japanese bombing attack on two American warships operating in the At Two area. But aside from mentioning that 15 twin engine bombers took part in the raid, the Navy gave no details. At Hot Springs, Virginia this evening, Richard Law, chairman of the British delegation, 
will offer to the food conference a detailed plan for freeing the post-war world from want. Though the text of his address will not be released until 7 o'clock, it's believed that his plan will entail an international food bank to lay away the agricultural surpluses of bumper years for international distribution in years of famine. Instead of curtailing production, it's understood, the British plan would increase production by subsidizing both the production and consumption of protective foods, that is, meat and dairy products, as well as cereals. Speaking of food, the new, new coffee ration will be 15% greater than any we've had so far. Step number 24, which becomes valid on May 31st, will provide one pound of coffee for a 30-day period. Heretofore, the most liberal ration has been one pound spread over 35 days. Gasoline rations, however, are going to become much smaller before they get any larger, at least on the eastern seaboard. The Office of Defense Transportation has, redu has reduced the rations of trucks, buses, and taxis by 40%. Only city buses and trucks serving war industries will be eligible for extra rations from now on. The WPB is now preparing a list of priorities. Luxury delivery service will simply be no more. Henceforth, it will be prohibited for stores to deliver such things as beer, liquor, ice cream, and flowers. I return you now to New York and Doug Edwards. Once again, here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Here's a message from our sponsor. How radar, now being built by Admiral, gets its name. Radar, through fog, clouds, darkness, and distance beyond the limits of human vision, detects enemy planes and ships and determines their exact location. In military terms, this is called radio detection and ranging. And radar is a composite of the initial letters of these four words. R-A for radio, D for detecting, A for and, R for ranging. Together we have R-A-D-A-R, -A -A -R, radar, a radio device for detecting and ranging. In peacetime, the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changers, Admiral today is turning out radar for Uncle Sam and the files of the War and Navy Departments give ample testimony of its value to our fighting men. Radar is at work now saving American lives, helping to destroy the enemy. Next week, Admiral will tell you how radar safeguards our convoys. For your country's sake, for your own sake, buy war bonds. Put every cent possible into war bonds. In so doing, you'll help stop inflation... You'll be supplying our boys with the planes, tanks, and guns they need, and you'll be providing yourself with a nest egg to use in obtaining the good things available when the war is won. Buy war bonds this week and every week. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. Warren Sweeney speaking for Admiral Radio. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The United States government presents... This is our enemy. Tonight, a United Nation goes forward with the determination to win this war and bring about a just and enduring peace. But we cannot win our war or make our peace unless we understand the character of the enemy we are fighting. That is why your government is bringing these programs to you. Later, you will hear Wallace Duell, well-known foreign correspondent. This is a program of truth. This is the truth about our enemy. <laughs> This is the story of a great slip-up. A big mistake our enemy made because of something he doesn't understand. The valor of the human spirit. Czechoslovakia had been taken to Munich without the firing of a shot, the weight of a single German soldier. 
And now just move in and check that country off the problem list. Of course, the Czech people would obey. They were defeated. They were helpless. There will be a parade in Park Wednesday to honor the National Socialist Party and to pay tribute to Reich's protector von Neurath. All Czech citizens will attend and cheer. You see, the text came as ordered. They line the streets and they do not cheer much. Sir, that won't show in the pictures. Conrad, you have your camera ready to catch Neurath as he passes by here? Yeah, Sir Colonel. This balcony is the best spot? Yeah. You see there, just below us, all the little Czech children mm-hmm. in their white dresses and best suits. Yeah, the flowers in their hands. <laughs> yeah, that was my idea. When Reich Protector Neurath passes, they will throw the flowers at his feet. Make a fine newsreel shot. Clear mm. evidence. Friendly collaboration. <laughs> Exposing the myth of that democratic start. German rape of Slovakia. <laughs> yeah, <it's> excellent, excellent. <laughs> Get ready, Conrad. Yeah, Herr Conrad. He's coming. Right behind the band there. That little boy in the front row was selected to give the signal to the other children. He should be ready now. I hope he does not forget. He seemed pleased to be chosen. These weak people flattered by our attention. Ah, there's Moirat. Why doesn't the child... He's raising his arm in a signal now. Uh, He's calling out. Here he comes. Turn your backs, everybody. Face the other way. Oh, yes. Yes. Now throw your brothers away from him. The Nazis didn't get their pretty pictures. But, after all, revolted the children. What did that matter? The conquerors strode on. Poland. Denmark. Norway. Ah, Norway would be easy. Norway is a Nordic state very much like Germany, France. It is easy to understand the people here and handle them. Yeah, not even language difficulty here. Most of them speak German, I understand. Yeah. Learn it in their schools. It's a required subject. But the Norwegians had thought of that, too. In whispered warnings... Turn your backs on the Germans. Do nothing to help them. They ask you questions, shake your heads or stare. Their language has become one of blood and lust. We no longer understand it. Say only that to them in our own dear language. Jeg forstår ikke deres språk. I do not understand German. Make it a theme song of Norway's refusal to give in. You there, girl. Tell me, uh, how do we go to reach the house Jeg of... Jeg forstår ikke deres språk. Oh, where, where is the... Jeg forstår ikke deres språk. What is the name of the place? Jeg forstår ikke deres språk. Annoying, yes. Provoking, inconvenient, insulting. But really of no consequence. Check off Norway. Taken. And move on. conquerors. Look at that altered map with pleasure. All of Europe ours. All of Europe yours. But things are happening in some of those captured countries. In Brussels, Belgium. But I tell you, they shout at me in the street. Those Belgian pigs. They insult me. It is not safe to walk alone here if you are children. I understand, Frau Hartmann, but we are getting many complaints. It's difficult to police everywhere. However, we have worked out a system. If there's any trouble, call us immediately on 22-221 and we will send the motorcycle squadron immediately. Well, it's time you were doing something. It's a disgrace. Number 22-221, you say? I will tell my family and friends. We will put it on the radio tonight so that everyone will know. Heil Hitler, Frau Hartmann. Any 
someone's in Brussels, molested on the streets, should immediately call number 22-221, and we will send officers. Under no circumstances shall any Belgian call that number. <laughs> Did you hear that, Maria? So we worry them, the master race. Special police to protect the Germans from us. The unarmed, conquered people. Special number. Under no circumstances shall any Belgian call it. Under no circumstances. What is it, Henri? What are you thinking? Oh, no Belgian is to call that number. Wait till I get Jean and Baptiste. No. No, Henri, they could trace the calls. No. They couldn't trace them from public street boxes, Maria. Twenty-two... Two twenty-one. Twenty-two, two twenty-one. Yes, yes. Where? A Montague Street and Avenue Louise. At once. Another complaint. The squad isn't back from the other ship. Yes, twenty-two, two twenty-one. That's right. What? Throwing stones and using clubs? Another? Everyone is out now on duty. So many calls. We'll send someone when we can, yes. Yeah? 22 to 21. Yeah? Man? Captain Gerhard. Oh, glad you are back. We are getting four calls a minute. I hope there are better calls than the three we've just been on. What do you mean, better? False alarm. Joke. What? Each call was the same. When we got there, the streets were empty. No complainants, no violators, but on the walls, scrolled in chalk. A V sign. And 1918. Belgian. Obviously. Then all these calls. Yeah, of course. Playing jokes. But degenerate people, they lose the war and yet play stupid jokes on their betters. But don't you see? They do not seem to think we are their betters. They are not acting as though they are afraid of us in spite of... in spite of everything. I do not like that. They ought to be afraid. Perceptive, that Gestapo man. The people... The poor, helpless people should have been afraid, but increasingly they were not. And that was the time the jokes began. And when once the people found that their conquerors were vulnerable, could be tricked, could be fooled, could be laughed at, the Superman myth died in a great hurry. Yes, they joked all over Europe. Gallows humor, the Czechs called it. From Norway comes the story of the Nazi soldiers who get drunk in a coastal village, comedied a car, and drove wildly through the streets. Finally, they careened down a dark pier and into the sea, promptly sinking. The Gestapo hurried to the scene and questioned an old fisherwoman at the end of the pier. Did you see the car coming? Yes. Well, why didn't you stop it? Why should I? I thought they were on their way to England. Another from Norway. A Norwegian farmer who had 30 hens received a threatening letter from the Germans ordering him to deliver more eggs to the Wehrmacht. Fourteen days later, they got the following reply. Your letter of the first instant was put up in the hen house so that the hens could see it for themselves. When they, after ten days, still had not resumed laying, I had them all shot for sabotage against the National Socialist Party. Yours faithfully. From Holland, the story of an attempted suicide. Fed up with conditions... Derek tried to hang himself, but the ersatz rope broke under his weight. Next, he threw himself into a canal, but his ersatz suit made of wood kept him afloat. In disgust, he bought some poison, but that was ersatz too and had no effect. Finally, he gave up the idea of suicide and started to live on his ration coupon. As a result, he died within a month. <laughs> From Belgium. Well, I must go home now to listen to the English news. Good night, all. Good night. Wait Good night. a minute, not so fast. I'm a Gestapo officer. I overheard you. You listen to the short leave? Every day. You know it's a button. Where's your radio? Oh, I haven't got one, but the walls are thin, and I listen to the German officers next door. From Czechoslovakia, the story of a remarkable decision of a town council of loyal Czechs. 
You all know he must appoint a citizen of this town to serve on the Nazi collaboration committee. Everyone we have approached has refused to accept the honor. What shall we do? Uh, I have a suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Yes, they come. Uh, why not appoint Hans Gundel? But he is an idiot. What's more, he's practically dumb. Well, that shouldn't stand in the way. All he's expected to do is say yes to everything the Germans propose. As you know, Hans Gundel is of German parentage, and he's the only German we have. Uh, the Germans boast of being a race of supermen, and according to their opinion, one German is equal to two Czechs, so all we have to say is that we thought that one German idiot would be equal to one normal Czech. Yes, they joked and annoyed the enemy with pinpricks. A Dutch calendar printed all the American holidays in red and ignored the German. Belgians thronged to railroad stations to say goodbye to Jewish friends being deported. Polish stores displayed English books. The Norwegians stayed away from churches where pro-Nazi ministers prayed. The Poles boycotted the movies because the money would go to the Germans. The Dutch cheered their quizzing mustard so loudly, no one could hear his speeches. And so it went. And then the jokes became more than jokes. The gestures more than gestures. The pinprick sharper. For instance, in Holland. See, bitch, it's what I've done. Look at the sign at the crossroads. Looks just like always. No, no, read it, bitch. The sign points east, and it says 20 miles to Earth. It points north, and it says 12 miles to Essen Hammerdown. But that's wrong. It's north from here to Erdek, and earth from here to Essen Hammerdown. I know, I know. I've turned it around, and they'll come along, the Germans, and they'll march the wrong way. Here they come. Run down. No, no, I want to watch them. I'm scared. They won't know the difference, Beatrix. They're stopping. 20 miles just to Erdek? Seems we should have been there by now. <laughs> what? What are you laughing for, boy? Come on. Come on, run away and stop talking. Yes, sir, yes, Captain. Salute. Hmm? Oh, a smart little Dutchman. Hmm? Well, you can stay and watch us as we go. It will be just like a parade for you. Hmm? Yes, Captain. Thank you, Captain. It will. We take the road to the north. What? <laughs> They're doing the goose step. They will be very tired walking 20 miles out of the way. <laughs> and 20 miles back again. You're a wonderful Don. <laughs> Still just pranks, you say? No. Listen to what followed. Your orders, Captain, were to arrive here at Urdek at 6 p.m. last night. You did not. But, but Colonel, I... Well, well, I explain that. You did not arrive on time. But I... At 7, the RAF came over. Your men were needed to man several anti-aircraft guns against them. Colonel, I... Your men were not here. The guns were not manned. The British scored two direct hits on the airfield oil tanks I... and got I... away spot free in a twilight rate which we should have been able to stop. I... I... I got lost. Lost? A captain? Yes. On the way here, I... I was misdirected. Misled. By whom, Captain? A little Dutch boy and girl. A little Dutch boy and girl. A successful RAF raid. See now why it was more than just a prank. In Poland, this happened. More ruined uniforms, eh? Yeah. You're a chemist, Hans. What do you make of them? These holes were caused by a hydrochloric acid. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. It eats right through. These uniforms will have to be replaced. How did it happen? I came to you for that information. No. I told you what did it. Now, you tell me who did it. You are the Gestapo. Ah, these wool poles. Got hold of the acid somewhere, threw it on our soldiers' uniforms in crowded places, on streetcars, in marketplaces. Have you caught any of them doing it? No, but we have a sufficient number of utility prisoners already arrested. Uh -huh. We can make examples of them. Charge them with it. We'll find the city a million lottie. What they hope to gain by such a stupid trick is beyond me. Beyond you, Herr Gestapo man. Hmm. 
then listened to two of your soldiers a few nights later on the dark, narrow streets of Warsaw. You know, August, I'll be glad when we move on out of the city. Strange things are going on. Are they moving out? I heard we'd be stationed here for months, Paul. I don't like it here. They hate us too much, these Poles. Now they're throwing us. Yeah, I heard about that, too. On uniforms. If it eats through cloth, it wouldn't feel good on skin, would it? Mm-hmm. And if it gets into your eyes... Uh, you have got to jit us bad, Paul. Uh, come on, we turn down here. Wait. What? Into into that dark alley. It's part of our patrol area. Who's to know whether we go down there or not? No one, I guess, but it's just, just the sort of place they'd hide waiting for us. We have got guns. What? Oh. What? Good the gun against acid in the eyes. You're getting on my nerves, Paul. It's not me, August. It's the pose. If you'll only admit it, we can't seem to kill enough of them to stop their fighting back in sneaky ways. I'm not going down there. If you want to go, go alone. No. No. I guess we can skip that alley tonight. In a basement in that dark alley, three poles were very busy at a hand-turned mimeograph machine. Makes enough noise to wake Hitler and Bert this guy. Hope no one comes this way for the next hour. We've got to get this out tonight. How is it coming, Joseph? Well enough, considering our printing instrument. Listen, we have learned that the German enemy is going to confiscate our warm clothing to send to their men on the eastern front. Mm -hmm. Citizens of Warsaw. Burn your woolen clothes and furs, even if you need them. Keep the enemy from getting them. Mm. Let the German soldiers freeze to death. We shall survive. Good. That should do it. Just watch the chimneys of Warsaw. The chimneys of Warsaw. Yes, smoke poured from them in the next days, and the odor of burning fur and wool hung low over the city. The Nazis got little warmth from that fire. What did the Poles hope to gain with their little frightening stunts, the acid throwing, the lurking in dark corners, the refusal to submit? Do you understand now, Herr Captain of the Gestapo? Oh, mind you, I'm not saying they look this far ahead. Perhaps the Poles themselves saw no connection between burning holes in the hated Nazi uniforms and the failure of a Nazi plan of confiscation. Maybe they only knew they must resist as best they could, in every way they could, no matter how small. But the resistances formed a little chain, leading to real results. The underground was growing in every country on that altered map. All of Europe, ours! Yes, yours, mine hair, to hold. You can't forget these people of Europe. You can't turn your backs on these slaves. They're chained, yes, but they chain you also. You've got to watch them. You've got to guard. They're learning fast. The resistances now are taking form and real meaning. They're carefully planned out now. Not just luck or coincidence, but planning, plotting. In his broadcast from London to his enslaved country, Foreign Minister Jan Maslick says, My people, you can serve our country by slowing down production in our plants which the Nazis have seized. Take the Skoda works alone, with 40,000 of you. If every one of you there dawdles and takes an extra two minutes when you go to the washroom, the Germans will lose 80,000 minutes of production a day. The Czechs have become masters of discreet sabotage. For every five workmen in the huge Skoda works, the Germans must keep one guard. They cannot send those men to the actual battlefronts against our allies or our soldiers. That is resistance that counts. In France, there is another item of factory resistance worth reporting. In a French war plant taken over by the Nazis. Pierre, Mm. this, um, this letter just came in from Berlin. It cancels the order for type CAX bearings. It orders much smaller ones. CA one half as a substitute. Maria, do you think you could lose that letter? Lose it? 
cancellation. The cancellation would be lost, too. The original order will hold and we'll go right on making the large CAX. If, when they're finished, the Bosch has no use for them. Well, too bad. I think I can lose the letter. In a confiscated Dutch plant, the Dutch manager assured his men... If any of you feel very tired or afraid, perhaps, that you may grow ill... I shall be very glad for you to take time off from the factory, as long as you need. I shall pay you full salary, of course. It is too bad if the work suffers, but, uh, well, it's too bad. All of this campaign against the enemy, the victorious enemy, does not go on in factories and offices, of course. On a farm in Denmark, they resist. Not with pitchforks, no. With hypodermics. Inject a little of this serum in the cow's leg, you say, doctor? Yes. I'm not being a good vet, I guess, to help kill cattle instead of cure. But I don't think any Danish cow would want to serve a German master. I know mine wouldn't. They've already requisitioned her. Doc, I think you might stop at Eric's farm and uh, old Gustav's, too, on your way today. Give them this information. Trustworthy men? Good Danes. Yes, Doc. On these Danish farms, they also fight with the common, everyday plow. Plow shallowly, so the land will bear poorly. They fight with oil and vinegar. Sprinkle it on the meat they force you to sell them. It will spoil it. <laughs> There's widespread sabotage in railway stations also. Though not with dynamite, nor in spectacular head-on collisions maneuvered between two giant locomotives. No, in orders for freight cars. Put in an order for three freight cars to ship equipment on March 1st. But, sir, we won't need three cars then. If we have them, the Germans won't. Oh. Do you see now how the resistance of the little man is beginning to take on shape and purpose? There's a pattern to it today. Across borders, cropping up here and there in this country and that, repeating itself. The same methods, a pooling of ideas and talents. Expanding, growing, succeeding. Word gets around by grapevine, underground press, secret radio. The Nazi bully without his blackjack or his gun is helpless. He naturally thought that would be true of other men. He was wrong. Deaf and blind, he still says today. You are all off. Next, the world. If he could listen to humanity with understanding, this is what he would hear on the winds of Europe. We are the many. Even if he did hear, the Nazi warlord would probably still strike his posture of God-man and shout back, You are little people. You can't work out your own destinies. I do that for you. Remember that. You will not dare to doubt. There must be no defiance, no dissatisfaction. You are little people, and you will submit. But they do doubt and do defy. Yes, we are little people, but we are the many. That is the coming nightmare for the dictators. The growing storm. We are the many. You, the few swaggering conquerors. There's no room in a decent world for you and your kind. We little people, thousands, millions of us, will join together and crowd you out of our world. And if the dictator and his nightmare can find the speaker in the crowd of speakers and mock him out for death, 
Why, then, another voice will speak. I take up his word. And I... Shoot us. One by one. There are not enough of you to shoot us all. And now you will hear from Wallace Duell, author of People Under Hitler and correspondent for the Chicago Daily News in Germany for six important years of Hitler's rise to power. Mr. Duell speaks to you from Washington. You have just heard a report on resistance of the common man, a story of the victories of the helpless but unbowed. It's a true story. Even as I am speaking to you, reports are coming in of increased resistance throughout Europe. Alone, of course, it is not enough to win this war, but as an aid to those of us who have arms and can wage open war, it is an ally of great strength and unsurpassed valor. It is an important commentary on the German psychology that the Nazis did not anticipate such resistance. Drunk and blind with their mad theories of blood, race, and supermen, the Nazis despise the common man. To have such people resist is an insult and affront to them. To have that resistance effective enough in many cases to defeat their plans and alter their timetable of conquest is incredible and somehow frightening. It is not logical. It is not in their pattern of order and obey. It is outside their understanding, and so they made their great mistake of not anticipating it and their greater of not knowing how to handle it. I appeared first on this radio program on its opening night a year ago. In the years since then, 52 programs have been presented to you, each adding something to your knowledge of the enemy. And in that year, the resistance of which this anniversary program speaks has spread in a pattern rightly becoming a nightmare to the enemy. As our understanding of the enemy increases and our allies' resistance to them spreads, these two great forces, knowledge of the means of victory and refusal to accept defeat, will merge into an irresistible tide of action and triumph. We wish to thank Wallace Duell for his appearance tonight. Nathan Van Cleve composed the music and conducted the orchestra. The script was written by Dorothea J. Lewis. The entire production was under the direction of Frank Telford. The following actors participated in tonight's broadcast. Frank Gallup, Agnes Young, Mitzi Gould, John Gibson, Roger DeCobin, E.A. Krumschmidt, Jack Smart, Stephen Schnabel, Richard Sanders, Lawson Zerby, Patsy O'Shea, and Ronnie Liss. This is Mutual.
This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is one of the most compelling actresses in America today, Miss Agnes Moorhead. Miss Moorhead returns to our stage to appear in a new study in terror by Lucille Fletcher called Sorry, Wrong Number. This story of a woman who accidentally overheard a conversation with death and who strove frantically to prevent murder from claiming an innocent victim is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Sorry, Wrong Number and the performance of Agnes Moorhead, we again hope to keep you in suspense. I've been dialing Murray Hill 70093 now for the last three quarters of an hour, and the line is always busy. I don't see how it could be busy that long. Will you try it for me, please? I will be glad to try that number for you. One moment, please. Now, I don't see how it could be busy all this time. It's my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor, and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. Hello? Uh, hello? Is Mr. Stevenson there? Hello? Come on. Oh, hello, George. Yes, sir. This is George speaking. Hello? Who's this? What number am I calling, please? I'm here with our client now. He says the coast is clear for tonight. Yes, sir. Where are you now? In a phone booth. They don't worry. Everything's okay. Very well. Now, you know the address. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on Second Avenue for a beer. Be sure that all the lights downstairs are on, eh? There should be only one light visible from the street. At 11.15, a train crosses the bridge. It makes a noise in case her window is open and she should scream. Oh, hello. What number is this, please? Okay. I understand. Now make it quick. As little blood as possible, huh? Our client does not wish to make us suffer long. Will a knife be okay, sir? Yeah, a knife will be okay. And uh, do you remember the other details? Yeah, yeah, I know. Remove the rings and bracelets and the jewelry and the bureau drawer. That's right. Our client wishes it to look like simple robbery. Now don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. All right, then. Be sure to... The... Oh. Oh. oh, how awful. How unspeakably awful. Please. Operator, I, I, I've just been cut off. I'm sorry. What number were you calling? Why, it, it was supposed to be Murray Hill 70093, but it wasn't. Some wires must have got crossed. I was cut into a wrong number, and I, I, I've, I've just heard the most dreadful thing. Something about a murder. And, uh, operator, you'll simply have to retrace that call at once. I beg your pardon. May I help you? Oh, I, I know it was the wrong number, and I had no business listening, but... These two men, they were cold-blooded fiends, and they were going to murder somebody, some poor innocent woman who was all alone in a house near a bridge, and we've got to stop them. We've got to... What number were you calling, please? Well, that doesn't matter. This was a wrong number, and you dialed it for me, and we've got to find out what it was immediately. What number did you call? Oh, why are you so stupid? What, what time is it? Do you mean to tell me you can't find out what that number was just now? 
I'll connect you with the chief operator. Oh, I think it's perfectly shameful. Now, look, look, it was obviously a case of some little slip of the finger. I, I told you to try Murray Hill 70093 for me. You dialed it, but your finger must have slipped, and I was connected with some other number. A- and I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. Now, now, I simply failed to see why you couldn't make that same mistake again on, on purpose, why you couldn't try to dial Murray Hill 70093 in the same sort of careless way. Murray Hill 70093, I will try to get it for you. Thank you. I'm sorry, Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you with 20... Operator! Operator! Uh, Operator, will you answer me? Your call, please. Well, you didn't try to get that wrong number at all. I asked you explicitly, and all you did was dial correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, What number are you calling? Oh, can't you for once forget what number I'm calling and do something for me? Now, I want to trace that call. It's my civic duty, it's your civic duty to trace that call and apprehend those dangerous killers. And if you won't... I will connect you with the chief operator. Please. Operator. Oh, uh, Chief Operator, I want you to trace a call, a, a telephone call immediately. I don't know where it came from or who was making it, but it's absolutely necessary that it be tracked down because it was about a murder that someone's planning. A, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman. Tonight at 11.15. I see. Well, can you trace it for me? Can you track down those men? I'm not certain. It depends. Depends on what? It depends on whether the call is still going on. If it's a live call, we can trace it on the equipment. If it's been disconnected, we can't. Disconnected? If the parties have stopped talking to each other. Oh, but, but of course they must have stopped talking to each other by now. That was at least five minutes ago, and they didn't sound like the type who would make a long call. Well, I can try tracing it. May I have your name, please? Mrs. Stevenson. Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Now, but, but listen... And your telephone number, please. Oh, Plaza 42295. But if you go on wasting all this time... Why do you want the call traced, please? Why? Well... Oh, no reason. No reason. I, I mean, I, I merely felt very strongly that something ought to be done about it. These, these men sounded like killers. They're, they're dangerous. They're going to murder this woman at 11.15 tonight, and I thought the police ought to know. Have you reported this to, to the police? Well, no, no, not yet. You want this call checked purely as a private individual? Yes, yes, but meanwhile... I'm sorry, Mrs. Stevenson, but I'm afraid we couldn't make this check for you and trace the call just in your say-so as a private individual. Well, I... We'd have to do something more official. Oh, for heaven's sake. You mean to tell me I can't report that there's going to be a murder without getting tied up in all this red tape? Why, it's perfectly idiotic. Well, then, all right, all right. I'll call the police. Thank you. I'm sure that would be the best way to... Ridiculous. It's perfectly ridiculous. Oh. Your call, please. Uh, The police department. Get me the police department, please. Uh, Thank you. Bringing the police department. Okay. Station, Precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Police Department, uh, this is Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Elbert Smythe Stevenson of 53 North Sutton Place. I'm calling up to report a murder. I mean, the murder hasn't been committed yet, but I, I, I just overheard plans for it over the telephone, over a wrong number that the operator gave me. I've been trying to trace down the call myself, but everybody is so stupid, and I, I guess in the end you're the only people who could do anything. Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it, it was a perfectly definite murder. I, I heard their plans distinctly. Uh, uh, two men were talking, and they were going to murder some woman at 11.15 tonight. Uh, she lived in a house near a bridge. Are you listening to me? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. And, and there was a private patrolman on the street. He was going to go around for a beer on 2nd Avenue. And, and, and there was some third man, a, a client, who was uh, paying to have this poor woman murdered. They were going to take her rings and bracelets and, and, and use a knife. Well, it's, it's unnerved me dreadfully, and I'm not well. Uh, I see. And I... 
When was all this, ma'am? Oh, well, uh, about eight minutes ago. Oh, uh, then you can do something. You do understand. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? Uh, Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Stevenson. And your address? Uh, 53 North Sutton Place. 53 North Sutton Place. That's near a bridge, the, the Queensboro Bridge, you know, and, and and we have a private patrolman on our street, and, and, and Second Avenue... And what was the number you were calling? Murray Hill 70093. But, but that wasn't the number I overheard. I, I mean, Murray Hill 70093 is my husband's office. He's, he's working late tonight, and I was trying to reach him to ask him to come home. I'm an invalid, you know, and uh, it's the maid's night off, and I hate to be alone even though he says I'm perfectly safe as long as I have the telephone right beside my bed. Well, we'll look into it, Mrs. Stevenson. And we'll see if we can check it with the telephone company. But the telephone company said they couldn't check the call if the parties had stopped talking. I've already taken care of that. Oh, you have? Yes. And personally, I feel you ought to do something far more immediate and drastic than just check the call. What good does checking the call do if they stop talking? By the time you track it down, they'll already have committed the murder. Well, we'll take care of it, don't you worry. Well, I'd say the whole thing calls for a search, a complete and thorough search of the whole city. Now, I'm very near the bridge, and I'm not far from 2nd Avenue, and I know I'd feel a lot better if, if you sent around a radio car to this neighborhood at once. And what makes you think the murder's going to be committed in your neighborhood, Oh, ma'am? well, I, I don't know. Only the coincidence is so horrible. 2nd Avenue and uh, uh, Patrolman and the bridge. 2nd Avenue is a very long street, ma'am. I know. And you know how many bridges there are in the city of New York alone. Oh. Not to mention Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, and the Bronx. I know. How do you know there isn't some little house out on Staten Island on some little 2nd Avenue you've never even heard about? Oh. How do you know they're even talking in, about New York at all? But I heard the call in the New York dialing system. Uh, maybe it was a long distance call you overheard. Oh. And telephones are funny things. Look, lady, why don't you look at it this way? Supposing you hadn't broken in on that telephone call. Supposing you'd got your husband the way you always do. You wouldn't be upset, would you? No, I suppose not. Only it it, it sounded so inhuman, so cold-blooded. A lot of murders are plotted in this city every day, ma'am. We manage to prevent most all of them, but a clue of this kind is so vague. It isn't much more use to us than no clue at all. But surely you... Unless, of course, uh, you have some reason for thinking this call was phony and that somebody may be planning to murder you. Me? Oh, well, no, I hardly think so. Well, I, I mean, why should anybody? I, I, I'm alone all day and night. I I see nobody except my maid, Eloise, and, and she's a big girl. She weighs 200 pounds. And she's too lazy to bring up my breakfast tray. And the, and the only other person is my husband, Albert. He's crazy about me. He just adores me. Wait. On me hand and foot has scarcely left my side since I took six twelve years ago. Well, and there's nothing for you to worry about. But I... Now, if you'll just leave the rest of this to us, but we'll take care of it. what will you do? It's so late. It's nearly 11 now. We'll take care of it, lady. Well, will you broadcast it all over the city and send out squads and, and, and warn your radio cars to watch out, especially in suspicious neighborhoods like mine? Lady, I said we'd take care of it. I... Just now, I've got a couple of other matters here on my desk that require immediate attention. Oh. Good night, ma'am, and thank you. Oh, you... You idiot. Oh. Oh, now, why did I hang up the phone like that? Now we'll think I am a fool. Oh, why doesn't Albert come home? Why doesn't he? Operator, for heaven's sake, will you ring that Murray Hill 70093 number again? I can't think what's keeping him so long. I will try it for you. Well, try, try. Oh. I'm nervous. I'm sorry. Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you. I can hear it. You don't have to tell me. I know it's busy. If I could only get out of this bed for a little while. If I could... If I could get a breath of fresh air or just lean out of the window or... Or see the street. Hello, Albert? Hello? 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 Oh, what's the matter with this phone? Hello? 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 Oh, for heaven's 
sake, who is this? Hello? 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 Operator, I don't know what's the matter with this telephone tonight, but it's positively driving me crazy. I've never seen such inefficient, miserable service. Now, 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 look. I'm an invalid, and I'm very nervous, and I'm not supposed to be annoyed. But if this keeps on much longer... What seems to be the trouble, please? Well, everything's wrong. I haven't had one bit of satisfaction out of one call I've made this evening. The whole world could be murdered for all you people care. And now, now, my phone keeps ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing every five seconds or so. And when I pick it up, there's no one there. I'm sorry. If you will hang up, I will test it for you. I don't want you to test it for me. I want you to put that call through, whatever it is, at, at once. I'm afraid I cannot do that. You can't? And why? Why, may I ask? The dial system is automatic. Oh. If someone is trying to dial your number, there is no way to check whether the call is coming through the system or not. Oh, th- unless the person who is trying to reach you complains to his particular operator. Well, of all this stupid... And meanwhile, I've got to sit here in my bed suffering every time that phone rings, imagining everything. I will try to check the trouble for check you. Check it, check it. That's all anybody can do. Oh, what's the use of talking to you? You're stupid. Oh, I'll fix her. Of all they impudence. Oh, how dare she speak to me like that? How dare she speak to me like that? Oh. Oh. She does it. Your call, please. Young woman, I don't know your name. But there are ways of finding you out. And I'm going to report you to your superiors for the most unpardonable rudeness and insolence that has ever been my privilege. Give me the business office at once. You may dial that number direct. Dial it direct? I'll do no such thing. I don't even know the number. The number is in the di- directory, or you may secure it by dialing information. Now listen here, you... Oh, what the you... Oh, dear. Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm going out of my mind. Not a... Hello? Hello? Stop ringing me, do you hear? Answer me. Who is this? Do you realize you're driving me crazy? Who's calling me? What are you doing it for? Now stop it, stop it, stop it, I say. Hello? Hello? If you don't stop ringing me, I'm going to call the police. you hear? The police! <laughs> oh, if Elbert would only come home. <laughs> oh, let it ring. Let it go on ringing. It's a trick of some kind. And I won't answer it. I won't. I won't, even if it goes on ringing all night. (laughs) Now, what's the matter? Why do they stop ringing all of a sudden? What time is it? Oh, where did I put that clock? <laughs> Five to eleven. Oh, oh, they've decided something. They're sure I'm home. They heard my voice answer them just now. That's why they've been ringing me. Why no one has answered me? Oh, I'm operator again. Oh, oh where is she? Why doesn't she answer? Oh, Brady. Why doesn't she answer? Your call, please. Where were you just now? Why didn't you answer at once? Give me the police department. I'm sorry. Just a minute. Oh. Oh. I'm uh, sorry. The line is busy. I will call you. Busy? Busy? But that's impossible. The police department can't be busy. There must be other lines available. The line is busy. Oh. I will try to get them for you later. No, no. I've got to speak to them now or it may be too late. I've got to talk to someone. What number do you wish to speak to? Please. I don't know, but there must be someone to protect people besides the police department. A, a, a detective agency. A, a, a... Uh, you will find agencies listed in the classified directory. But I don't have a classified directory. I, 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 I mean, I'm too nervous to I look it up. I will collect you with information. Know. Perhaps she will be able to help you. No, no. Oh, you're being spiteful, aren't you? You don't care, do you, what happens to me? I could die and you would care. <laughs> oh, stop it. Stop it! I can't stay it anymore! Hello? What do you want? Stop ringing, will you? Stop it! Hello? Is this Plaza 42295? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, I'm... I'm, I'm sorry. This, uh, yes, this is Plaza 42295. This is Western Union. Yes. I have a telegram here for Mrs. Albert Stevenson. Yes. Is there anyone there to receive the message? Yes, I'm Mrs. Stevenson. The telegram is as follows. Mrs. Albert Stevenson, 53 North Sutton Place, New York, New York. Darling, terribly sorry. Tried to get you for last hour, but line busy. Oh. Leaving for Boston, 11 p.m. tonight on urgent business. Back tomorrow afternoon. Keep happy. Love. Signed, Albert. Oh, no. Do you wish us to deliver a copy of the message? No. No, thank you. Thank you, madam. Good night. Good night. Oh, oh. oh no. No, I don't believe it. He couldn't do it. Not when he knows I'll be all alone. <laughs> It's some trick. It's some trick. Something. Some Phoenix trick. I know. Oh, oh I'm so nervous. Oh, I don't Your call, please. Operator, try that Murray Hill 70093 number for me just once more, please. You may dial that number direct. Hospital. Hensley Hospital? Yes. Do you have the street address? No. No, it's somewhere in the 70s. It's a very small, uh, private and exclusive hospital where I had my appendix out two years ago. Uh, Hensley, H-E-N-C-S. Well, will you please hurry and, and uh, please, what is the time? You may find out the time by dialing Meridian 71212. Oh, for heaven's sake, I've no time to be dialing. The number of Hensley Hospital is Butterfield 70105. Butterfield 70105. Registry. Who was it you wished to speak to, please? I want the nurse's registry at once. I, I I, want a trained nurse. I want to hire immediately for the night. I see. And what is the nature of the case, madam? Nerves. I, I, I'm very nervous. I I need soothing and, and companionship. You, you see, my husband is away, and I'm... Have you been recommended to us by any doctor in particular, madam? No, but I really don't see why all this catechizing is necessary. I, I, I just want a trained nurse. I was a patient in your hospital two years ago, and... After all, I, I do expect to pay this person for attending me. We quite understand that, madam, but these are war times, you know. I know that. Registered nurses are very scarce just now. And our superintendent has asked us to send people out only on cases where the physician in charge feels it's absolutely necessary. Well, it is absolutely necessary. I'm a sick woman. I'm I'm very much upset, very. I'm, I'm alone in this house, and I'm an invalid, and, and, and tonight I overheard a telephone conversation that upset me dreadfully. In fact, if, if someone doesn't come at once, I'm afraid I'll go out of my mind. I see. 
Well, I'll speak to Miss Phillips as soon as she comes in. And what is your name, ma'am? Miss Phillips? And when do you expect her in? I really couldn't say. She went out to supper at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? But it's, it's not 11 o'clock yet. Oh, Oh, my clock has stopped. I thought it was running down. What time is it? Just just 15 minutes past 11. What was that? What was what, madam? That, that click just now in my own telephone. As though someone had lifted the receiver off the hook of the extension telephone downstairs. Well, I didn't hear it, madam. Now, about this... But I, I did. There's, there's someone in this house. Someone downstairs in the kitchen. And they're, they're listening to me now. They're listening! Uh, I won't... I won't pick it up. I... I won't let them hear me. I won't let them hear me. I'll be quiet. I'll be so quiet. And they'll think... Oh... Oh, but if I don't call someone now, while they're still down there... Wait... There'll be no time. Your call, please. Operator, I'm I'm in desperate trouble. I'm sorry, I, I cannot hear you. Please speak louder. I I I, I don't dare. I, there's someone listening. Can can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Oh, but you've got to you've got to hear me. Oh, please. Please, you've got to help me. There's, there's someone in this house. Someone who's going to murder me. And, and you've got to get in touch with... You... Oh. oh, there it is. There it is. Did you hear it? He's, he's put it down. He's put down the extension phone. He's, he's coming up. Ah. Oh, he's coming upstairs. Okay, give me the police department. The police department. Give me the police department. One moment, please. I will connect you. I can hear him. Oh, I can hear him. He's coming near. Oh, I know it. Hurry. Hurry. Hurry, please. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Must have got the wrong number. Precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Police Department, Martin speaking. Police Department, Martin speaking. Oh, Police Department? Police Department. I'm sorry, must have got the wrong number. But, but don't worry, everything's okay. So closes Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Agnes Moorhead, tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Mr. Donald Crisp and Mr. John Loder will star in the suspense play called The Extra Guest. Producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who attended this, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, and Lucille Fletcher, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is one of the most compelling actresses in America today, Miss Agnes Moorhead. Miss Moorhead returns to our stage to appear in a new study in terror by Lucille Fletcher called Sorry, Wrong Number. This story of a woman who accidentally overheard a conversation with death and who strove frantically to prevent murder from claiming an innocent victim is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you Stir your nerves to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Sorry, Wrong Number and the performance of Agnes Moorhead. We again hope to keep you in suspense. I've been dialing Murray Hill 70093 now for the last three quarters of an hour, and the line is always busy. I don't see how it could be busy that long. Will you try it for me, please? I will be glad to try that number for you. One moment, please. I don't see how it could be busy all this time. It's my husband's office. He's working late tonight, and I'm all alone here in the house. My health is very poor, and I've been feeling so nervous all day. Ringing Murray Hill 70093. Hello? Uh, hello? Is Mr. Stevenson hello? there? Hello? Hello? Oh, hello, George. Yes, sir. This is George speaking. Hello? Who's this? What number am I calling, please? I'm here with our client now. He says the coast is clear for tonight. Yes, sir. Where are you now? In a phone booth. So don't worry. Everything's okay. Very well. Now, you know the address. At 11 o'clock, the private patrolman goes around to the bar on 2nd Avenue for a beer. Be sure that all the lights downstairs are on, eh? There should be only one light visible from the street. At 11.15, a train crosses the bridge. It makes a noise in case her window is open and she should scream. Oh, hello. What number is this, Steve? Okay. I understand. Now make it quick. As little blood as possible, eh? Our client does not wish to make her supper long. Will a knife be okay, sir? Well, the knife will be okay. And uh, do you remember the other details? Yeah, yeah, I know. Remove the rings and bracelets and the jewelry and the bureau drawer. That's right. Our client wishes it to look like simple robbery. But don't worry. Everything is going to be okay. All right, then. Be sure to... Oh, I... oh. oh, how awful. How unspeakably awful. Your call, please. Operator, I, I, I've just been cut off. I'm sorry. What number were you calling? Why, it, it was supposed to be Murray Hill 70093, but it wasn't. Some wires must have got crossed. I was cut into a wrong number, and I, 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 I've just heard the most dreadful thing. Something about a murder. And, Operator, you'll simply have to retrace that call at once. I beg your pardon. May I help you? Oh, I, I know it was the wrong number, and I had no business listening, but these two men, they were cold-blooded fiends, and they were going to murder somebody, some poor innocent woman who was all alone in a house near a bridge, and we've got to stop them. We've got to... What number were you calling, please? Well, that doesn't matter. This was a wrong number, and you dialed it for me, and we've got to find out what it was immediately. What number did you call? Oh, why are you so stupid? 
Oh, what time is it? You mean to tell me you can't find out what that number was just now? I'll connect you with the chief operator. Oh, I think it's perfectly shameful. Now, look, look, it was obviously a case of some little slip of the finger. I, I told you to try Murray Hill 70093 for me. You dialed it, but your finger must have slipped, and I was connected with some other number. A- and I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. Now, now, I simply fail to see why you couldn't make that same mistake again on, on purpose, why you couldn't try to dial Murray Hill 70093 in the same sort of careless way. Murray Hill 70093, I will try to get it for you. Thank you. Oh. I'm sorry, Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you at 20... Operator! Operator! Uh, operator, will you answer me? Your call, please. Well, you didn't try to get that wrong number at all. I asked you explicitly, and all you did was dial correctly. I'm sorry. Uh, what number are you calling? Oh, can't you for once forget what number I'm calling and do something for me? Now, I want to trace that call. It's my civic duty, it's your civic duty to trace that call and apprehend those dangerous killers. And if you won't... I will connect you with the chief operator. Please. Oh. Oh, uh, Chief Operator, I want you to trace a call, a, a telephone call immediately. I don't know where it came from or who was making it, but it's absolutely necessary that it be tracked down because it was about a murder that someone's planning. A, a terrible, cold-blooded murder of a poor, innocent woman. Tonight at 11.15. I see. Well, can you trace it for me? Can you track down those men? I'm not certain. It depends. Depends on what? It depends on whether the call is still going on. If it's a live call, we can trace it on the equipment. If it's been disconnected, we can't. Disconnect? If the parties have stopped talking to each other. Oh, but, but of course they must have stopped talking to each other by now. That was at least five minutes ago, and they didn't sound like the type who would make a long call. Well, I can try tracing it. May I have your name, please? Mrs. Stevenson. Mrs. Elbert Stevenson. Now, but, but listen... And your telephone number, please. Oh, Plaza 42295. But if you go on wasting all this time... Why do you want the call traced, please? Why? Well... Oh, no reason. No reason. I, I mean, I, I merely felt very strongly that something ought to be done about it. These, these men sounded like killers. They're, they're dangerous. They're going to murder this woman at 11.15 tonight, and I thought the police ought to know. Have you reported this to, to the police? Well, no, no, not yet. You want this call checked purely as a private individual? Yes, yes, but meanwhile... I'm sorry, Mrs. Stevenson, but I'm afraid we couldn't make this check for you and trace the call just in your say-so as a private individual. Well, I... We'd have to do something more official. Oh, for heaven's sake. You mean to tell me I can't report that there's going to be a murder without getting tied up in all this red tape? Why, it's perfectly idiotic. Well, all right, all right. I'll call the police. Thank you. I'm sure that would be the best way to... Ridiculous. It's perfectly ridiculous. Oh... Please. Uh, the police department. Get me the police department, please. Thank you. Bringing the police department. Police station, precinct 43, Sergeant Martin speaking. Uh, police department, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Elbert Smythe Stevenson of 53 North Sutton Place. I'm calling up to report a murder. I, I mean, the murder hasn't been committed yet, but I, I, I just overheard plans for it over the telephone, over a wrong number that the operator gave me. I've been trying to trace down the call myself, but everybody is so stupid, and I, I guess in the end you're the only people who could do anything. Yes, ma'am. Well, it, it, it was a perfectly definite murder. I, I heard their plans distinctly. Uh, uh, two men were talking, and they were going to murder some woman at 11.15 tonight. She lived in a house near a bridge. Are you listening to me? Uh, 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 yes, ma'am. And and there was a private patrolman on the street. He was going to go around for a beer on 2nd Avenue, and and there was some third man, a a client, who was uh, paying to have this poor woman murdered. They were going to take her rings and bracelets and and use a knife. Well, it's it's unnerved me dreadfully, and I'm not well. Well, I see you, When was all this, ma'am? Well, uh, about eight minutes ago. Oh, uh, 
then you can do something you do understand. Uh, what is your name, ma'am? Uh, Mrs. Stevenson, Mrs. Albert Stevenson. And your address? Uh, 53 North Sutton Place. 53 North Sutton Place. That's near a bridge. The, the Queensborough Bridge, you know. And, and, and we have a private patrolman on our street. And, and, and Second Avenue... And what was the number you were calling? Murray Hill 70093. But that wasn't the number I overheard. I, I mean, Murray Hill 70093 is my husband's office. He's, he's working late tonight, and I was trying to reach him to ask him to come home. I'm an invalid, you know, and uh, it's the maid's night off, and I hate to be alone, even though he says I'm perfectly safe as long as I have the telephone right beside my bed. Well, we'll look into it, Mrs. Stevenson. Well, and we'll see if we can check it with the telephone company. But the telephone company said they couldn't check the call if the parties had stopped talking. I've already taken care of that. Oh, you have? Yes. And personally, I feel you ought to do something far more immediate and drastic than just check the call. What good does checking the call do if they stop talking? By the time you track it down, they'll already have committed the murder. Well, we'll take care of it. Don't you worry. Well, I'd say the whole thing calls for a search, a complete and thorough search of the whole city. Now, I'm very near the bridge, and I'm not far from 2nd Avenue, and I know I'd feel a lot better if, if you sent around a radio car to this neighborhood at once. And what makes you think the murder's going to be committed in your neighborhood, Oh, ma'am? well, I, I don't know. Only the coincidence is so horrible. 2nd Avenue and the uh, uh, patrolman and the bridge. 2nd uh, Avenue is a very long street, ma'am. I know. And you know how many bridges there are in the city of New York alone. Oh. Not to mention Brooklyn, Staten Island, Queens, the Bronx. I know. How do you know there isn't some little house out on Staten Island or on some little 2nd Avenue you've never even heard about? Oh. How do you know they're even talking in, about New York at all? But I heard the call in the New York dialing system. Uh, maybe it was a long-distance call you overheard. Oh. And telephones are funny things. Look, lady, why don't you look at it this way? Supposing you hadn't broken in on that telephone call. Supposing you'd got your husband the way you always do. You wouldn't be upset, would you? No, I suppose not. Only it, it, it sounded so inhuman, so cold-blooded. Well, a lot of murders are plotted in this city every day, ma'am. Well, we I... manage to prevent most all of them, but a clue of this kind is so vague. I... Isn't much more use to us than no clue at but all. But surely you... Unless, of course, uh, you have some reason for thinking this call was phony and that somebody may be planning to murder you. Me? Oh, well, no, I hardly think so. Well, I, I mean, why should anybody? I, I, I'm i alone all day and night. I I see nobody except my maid, Eloise, and, and she's a big girl. She weighs 200 pounds. And she's too lazy to bring up my breakfast tray. And the, and the only other person is my husband, Albert. He's crazy about me. He just adores me. Wait. On me hand and foot, it's scarcely left my side since I took six, twelve years ago. Well, and there's nothing for you to worry about. Well, I... Now, if you'll just leave the rest of this to us, we'll but take care of it. what will you do? It's so late. It's nearly eleven now. We'll take care of it later. Well, will you broadcast it all over the city and send out squads and, and, and warn your radio cars to watch out, especially in suspicious neighborhoods like mine? Lady, I said we'd take care of it. I... Just now, I've got a couple of other matters here on my desk that require immediate attention. Oh, good night, ma'am, and thank you. Oh, you, you idiot. Oh. Oh, now, why did I hang up the phone like that? Now we'll think I am a fool. Oh, why doesn't Albert come home? Why doesn't he? Operator, for heaven's sake, will you ring that Murray Hill 70093 number again? I can't think what's keeping him so long. I will try it for you. Well, try, try. Oh. So nervous. Why does it so long? I'm sorry. Murray Hill 70093 is busy. I will call you. I can hear it. You don't have to tell me. I know it's busy. Oh, if, if I could only get out of this bed for a little while. If I could if I could get a breath of fresh air or just lean out of the window or, or see the street. <laughs> Hello, Albert? Hello? 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 Oh, what's the matter with this phone? Hello? 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 Oh, for heaven's 
sake, who is this? Hello? 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 Operator, I don't know what's the matter with this telephone tonight, but it's positively driving me crazy. I've never seen such inefficient, miserable service. Now, 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 look. I'm an invalid, and I'm very nervous, and I'm not supposed to be annoyed. But if this keeps on much longer... What seems to be the trouble, please? Well, everything's wrong. I haven't had one bit of satisfaction out of one call I've made this evening. The whole world could be murdered for all you people care. And now, now, my phone keeps ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing every five seconds or so. And when I pick it up, there's no one there. I'm sorry. If you will hang up, I will test it for you. I don't want you to test it for me. I want you to put that call through. Whatever it is, it, it wants. I'm afraid I cannot do that. You can't. And why? Why, may I ask? dial system is automatic. Oh. If someone is trying to dial your number, there is no way to check whether the call is coming through the system or not. Oh, th- unless the person who is trying to reach you complains to this particular operator. Well, of all this stupid. And meanwhile, I've got to sit here in my bed suffering every time that phone rings, imagining everything. I will try to check the trouble for check you. Check it, check it. That's all anybody can do. Oh, what's the use of talking to you? You're stupid. Oh, I'll fix her. Of all late impudence. Oh, how dare she speak to me like that? How dare she speak to me like that? Oh. Your call, please. Young woman, I don't know your name, but there are ways of finding you out. And I'm going to report you to your superiors for the most unpardonable rudeness and insolence that has ever been my privilege. Give me the business office at once. You may dial that number direct. Dial it direct? I'll do no such thing. I don't even know the number. The number is in the diet directory. Or you may secure it by dialing information. Now listen here, you... Oh, what's the use? Oh, for heaven's sake, I'm going out of my mind. Out of... Hello? Hello? Stop ringing me, do you hear? Answer me. Who is this? You realize you're driving me crazy? Who's calling me? What are you doing it for? Now stop it, stop it, stop it, I say. Hello? Hello? If you don't stop ringing me, I'm going to call the police. You hear? The police! (laughs) Oh, if Alfred would only come home. (laughs) Oh, let it ring. Let it go on ringing. It's a trick of some kind. And I won't answer it. I won't. I won't, even if it goes on ringing all night. (laughs) Now, what's the matter? Why do they stop ringing all of a sudden? What time is it? Where did I put that clock? <laughs> Five to eleven. Oh, oh, they've decided something. Oh, they're sure I'm home. They heard my voice answer them just now. That's why they've been ringing me. Why no one has answered me? Oh, I love my idea. Oh, oh, where is she? Why doesn't she answer Busy. There must be other lines available. The line is busy. Oh. I will try to get them for you later. No, no, I've got to speak to them now, or it may be too late. I've got to talk to someone. What number do you wish to speak to? Please? I don't know, but there must be someone to protect people beside the police department. I, 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 a detective agency. A, a... Uh, you will find agencies listed in the classified directory. But I don't have a classified directory. I, 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 I mean, I'm too nervous to look I will it connect up, you with information. Know. Perhaps she will be able to help you. No, no. Hello? It's Esplaza 
973 number for me just once more, please. You may dial that number direct. my appendix out two years ago. Uh, Henshley, H-E-N-C-A. Well, will you please hurry and... and uh, please, what is the time? You may find out the time by dialing Meridian 71212. Oh, for heaven's sake, I've no time to be dialing. The number of Henshley Hospital is Butterfield 70105. Butterfield 70105. Nurses registry. Who was it you wish to speak to, please? I want the nurses registry at once. I, I, I want a trained nurse. I want to hire immediately for the night. I see. And what is the nature of the case, madam? Nurse. I, I, I'm very nervous. I, I need soothing and, and companionship. You, you see, my husband is away, and I'm Have also... Have you been recommended to us by any doctor in particular, madam? No, but I really don't see why all this catechizing is necessary. I, I, I just want a trained nurse. I was a patient in your hospital two years ago, and after all, I, I do expect to pay this person for attending me. Well, we quite understand that, madam, but these are war times, you know. I know that. Registered nurses are very scarce just now, and our superintendent has asked us to send people out only on cases where the physician in charge feels it's absolutely necessary. Well, it is absolutely necessary. I'm a sick woman. I'm I'm very much upset, very I'm, I'm alone in this house, and I'm an invalid, and, and, and tonight I overheard a telephone conversation that upset me dreadfully. In fact, if, if someone doesn't come at once, I'm afraid I'll go out of my mind. I see. Well, I'll speak to Miss Phillips as soon as she comes in. And what is your name, ma'am? Miss Phillips? And when do you expect her in? I really couldn't say. She 
went out to supper at 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? But it, it's not 11 o'clock yet. Oh, oh, my clock has stopped. I thought it was running down. What time is it? Just, just 15 minutes past 11. What was that? What was what, madam? That, that click just now in my own telephone. As though someone had lifted the receiver off the hook of the extension telephone downstairs. Well, I didn't hear it, madam. Now, about this... But I, I did. There's, there's someone in this house. Someone downstairs in the kitchen. And they're, they're listening to me now. They're listening! Uh, I won't... I won't pick it up. I... I won't let them hear me. I won't let them hear me. I'll be quiet. I'll be so quiet. And they'll think... Oh. Oh, but if I don't call someone now, while oh, they're still down there. Wait. There'll be no time. Your call, please. Operator. I'm I'm in desperate trouble. I'm sorry. I cannot hear you. Please speak louder. I I I, I don't dare. I, there's someone listening. Can can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Oh, but you, you've got to, you've got to hear me. Oh, please, please, you've got to help me. There's, there's someone in this house, someone who's going to murder me, and and you've got to get in touch with you. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Did you hear it? He's he put it down. He put down the extension phone. He's, he's coming up. I'm sorry, I must have got the wrong number. But, but don't worry, everything's okay. So closes Sorry, Wrong Number, starring Agnes Moorhead, tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Mr. Donald Crisp and Mr. John Loder will star in the suspense play called The Extra Guest. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, and Lucille Fletcher, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presenting Trash is Cash with Walt Kramer. Well, how do you do, friends? This is Walt Kramer, your Blues Tamer Framer, all set to give away the Encard Trash Register, including the shirt off my bag as needs just to make your afternoon listening a bit more pleasurable and profitable, too. Well, friends, get all set for a merry-go-round of fun. I'm going to buy all the old junk that you've got laying around the house and in your pocket or purse, too. First, let's buy a recorded tune from our guest band of this afternoon. Bob Crosby and the Bobcats are on hand, 
Stay there, Bobby. I'll pay you a dollar thirty-seven. everyone in the old groove. Yes, indeedy. Now, here's how we do business on the Trash is Cash program. First of all, I buy silly, ridiculous items from folks listening in. On the telephone. Yes, my trusty Mr. Bell and I are all set to dial a list of phone numbers selected at random from our members. Members of the TICS. T-I-C-S. The Trash is Cash Society. We've got a handsome engraved membership card which entitles you to sell or give away any of the accumulation of useless things that you've been saving for years. The membership card has a place on it for your name and your address. And when we get your membership application in the mail with your phone number, that number goes right into the tick box, and from that box comes our phone numbers. When we dial your number, we offer you a certain amount of cash merely for repeating the item called for. If you can identify the item requested just before the call, when I say, have you got it? Why? You get not only the asking price, but also the entire contents of the trash register. If, however, you can't repeat the item called for, you can still get the asking price merely by mailing or bringing the item to Trash is Cash, W-O-R, New York. Well, seeing or hearing is believing. Let's get started, and we'll show you how it works. Hmm, let's see now. The old trash register says $18.73. 1873 that somebody can win right now. All right. Now, let's select an item from the mailbag. Here are all the letters and cards that came in this morning. Let's see. Things right down here in the middle. Now, there's a letter coming right out from Ozone Park, New York City. Let's see what it says. Ah, uh, dear Walframer, call for one. one. Well, all righty. It's from new member of the ticks, Mr. Harry Wellman of Ozone Park, New York. And Mr. Wellman will get a dollars of the war stamps in the mail for the use of his suggestion. Here it comes now. Oh, are you listening? Are you listening? Have you got it? Have you got it? Have you got it? I offer a dollar twenty-three. I offer a dollar twenty-three. A dollar and twenty-three cents for one one collar button. Yes, a dollar twenty-three cents for one collar button. Now for our first phone number, we've taken one from our membership list, selected at random, and here it is. Now remember, friends, as I dial this number, I want you to keep in mind 
that your suggestions are cordially invited. And if the person that I talk to can't repeat the item, then Mr. Harry Wellman gets a dollar in war stamps and a dollar twenty-three goes into the trash register, which is now up to eighteen seventy-three. Now, while I'm explaining what's what to whoever answers, let's hear from Bob Crosby and the Bobcats with At the Jazz Band Ball. of our listening audience, I've got to be sick. And while Bob and the boys have been playing at the jazz band hall, I've been getting acquainted with a lovely lady here on the telephone, Mrs. James McGillicuddy, who lives at 184 West 66th Street, Manhattan. Is that right, Mrs. McGillicuddy? It is? That's fine. How long have you been living there? Ten years. Say, that's a long time, isn't it? Well, look, Mrs. McGillicuddy, it's too bad that you weren't listening to Trash's Cash on WOR this afternoon, because if you had, and you could have identified the item in price, you'd be in the amount in our trash register right now, which happens to be $18.73. Yes, too bad. Well, Mrs. McGillicuddy, if you can mail me or bring to the studio within 24 hours a collar button, I'll pay you $1.23 for it. Or if you uh, just want to forget about the whole thing, I'll send you a dollar with a war saving stamp. Huh? What's that? Oh, you think you have a collar button? Fine. Oh, oh look, uh, do you think you can spare it? I mean, collar buttons are pretty hard to get nowadays, you know. Or well, doesn't Mr. McGillicuddy wear them anymore? Hmm? Oh, I see. Well, that's fine. Now, just remember, when you mail it or bring it bring it to Trash is Cash. W-O-R, New York. Uh, our operator will tell you all about it. Thank you very much. All righty. Well, there you are, friends. And to Mr. Harry Wellman of Ozone Park, New York, goes a dollar's worth of war stamps for the use of his suggestion. While a dollar twenty-three goes into the jackpot or trash register, which means this next phone call we've got eighteen seventy-three plus a dollar twenty-three, and let's see, uh, a grand total of uh, nineteen dollars and ninety-six cents. Ring it up there. Yes, indeed. Well, nineteen ninety-six. Wow. Uh, well, now let's see. On the next call and on to the next item. We're going to offer some cash here. A penny postcard coming out of the mailbag now from Dover, New Jersey. From Miss Harriet Holly. She says she listens to our Trash's Cash program every afternoon while she serves the customers at the Star Restaurant in Dover. Okay, sweet waitress, you dish up the hash and I'll hash up the airwaves. Now, here we go. Miss Holly gets a dollar's worth of war stamps for the use of her item, and here we come now. Have you got it? Have you got it? Have you got it? Have you got it? Ah, look sharp, folks. Look sharp. I offer 98 cents. 98 cents. For one, one, oh, it's going to be good. For one hair off your mother-in-law's head. That's an expensive hair, all right. 98 cents for a hair off your mother-in-law's head. And now we select a phone number from our composite phone book of New York's five boroughs. And here's that phone number. Yes, we're dialing it right now. And while we're dialing it, how about you doping out a few screwy items that you can send in to us, huh? Don't send the items now. Just send a letter of postcard telling about them. While I get acquainted with this person that we're calling now, let's hear from Bob Crosby and the boys with complaining. Thank you. 
gentlemen of the tick, the Trash is Cash Society. Come to order, please. I have an answer here. I've dialed Wadsworth 80543, and I'm talking to Mrs. Mary Ann Spencer of 1860 Caledonia Avenue. That's over in Brooklyn, isn't it, Mrs. Spencer? Huh? In Brooklyn, right. Good old Brooklyn, the garden spot of America. Well, uh, Mr. Spencer, you say this is, this is the first day that you've missed our program in week? Well, that is too bad, because you know that it costs you $19.96 not to listen today. That's how much there was in the trash register for you. If you could have told me what the item was and the price. Well, too bad. But look, the item happens to be a hair off your mother-in-law's head, and I offered 98 cents for it. What, you think you can get one for tomorrow? You what? Oh, oh, too bad you have no mother-in-law. Well, perhaps you're lucky. Now, I can just hear a lot of guys listening into the program saying, saying that, but as for me, I've always found mothers-in-law sweet and charming. Mm-hmm. Yes, you said it, Mrs. Spencer. Oh, oh, you're a mother-in-law. Fine. Well, then I mean that double. Well, look, let's settle for a dollar to the war stamp, shall we? Good, good. I'll turn you right over to our WOR operator. Thank you and goodbye. Well, there we are, friends. Mrs. Spencer wasn't listening today, but into the trash register goes that 98 cents. Making a total of, let's see now, $19.96 plus 98 cents, which is all of $20.94. Ring it up! Hey, $20.94. That's getting up there right above the $20 mark. And now, before making our next call, may I repeat the bylaws of our Trash is Cash Society. Any person listening is eligible to write in a letter or postcard a suggestion for items to be bought on this broadcast. Your first letter or card will automatically entitle you to receive our membership card and also put your telephone number into our member file. So, when you write in, be sure to give your full name and address plus your telephone number, please. Also, be sure to write down only one have you got it suggestion. Any item which you think might be funny or hard to get. And after your first letter or card, you may write again as often as you wish, giving each time only one item to be called for. Now, all usable suggestions go into the pick or the Trash is Cash Society box, and letters or cards are selected at random. We reserve the right to eliminate any objectionable suggestions or duplicate suggestions for the same program. Our mailing address again is Trash is Cash, W-O-R, New York. May I repeat that? Trash is Cash, W-O-R, New York. Oh, oh, there we go, friends. There's the old chime says it's closing time for the day for the Trash is Cash Society. Well, let's check up on that old trash register. And uh, we see we have a nice goodly sum of money over the $20 mark. Indeed, we are, friends. Yes, it's exactly $20 and... 32 cents in the trash register. Yes, indeed. Well, until tomorrow, when our anti sire puts B gets back into action at the same time. In the meantime, if you have any screwball stuff that you want me to buy, why, let's get it down on a letter or postcard. If it's your first try and you want to join in the fun and be a member, be sure to give your full name and address and telephone number where we might call you on our trash is cash private line. Come on, come all. Just write today to Trash is Cash, care of WOR New York. Trash is Cash. W.O.R. New York. So, friends, till tomorrow afternoon at the same time. This is your chief, chief of trash. Your this is there. Have you got it? Have you got it? Have you got it? Blues tamer, wall framer saying so long. And look, don't throw it out because trash is cash. <laughs> Originated by Walt Samer was suggested by the original radio swap program known as Have You Got It? Listen again tomorrow afternoon at the same time. W.O.R. 71 on the dial. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Each Saturday at this same time, the National Broadcasting Company presents Morgan Beatty's War Telescope a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. Morgan Beatty is NBC's veteran war reporter in the British capital. And so for his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is Morgan Beatty looking at the 195th week of war through the war telescope. This was the week of decision. Russia, China, Britain, and our own United States reached the crossroads of war and confirmed their determination to walk down the dangerous highway together for better or for worse. A single sentence of decision, 22 words, 
comes to us from President Roosevelt after the United Nations have won two major victories at Stalingrad and in Tunisia. We don't like to remind ourselves, but it is a fact, that the enemy has won more and greater military victories. Three years ago today, the big and little boats of Englishmen began to shuttle back and forth across the channel, bringing back a pitiful burden of war from Dunkirk. Above these plain Englishmen, the RAF fighters roared in protection. College men, professional airmen, titled youth, proved that you can't win without local mastery of the air. And spitfire and hurricane became household words. Thus it was that hundreds of thousands were rescued from the beaches of Dunkirk instead of the few. The plain people of Britain managed a miracle of heroism. But it was a defeat. The Germans had slammed shut the door on Europe. All that followed in France and the Balkans was merely the cleanup, confirmation. So it was that the people of Britain learned that disaster is born out of mistakes of the past, blunders that one by one exposed the heart of an empire to the guns of the enemy. Just about then, we Americans began to stir uneasily. Early in June 1940, Congress took up a vague new defense bill designed to raise a few hundred more million dollars for ships and guns. The president asked for the right to call out the National Guard to train the youth of America for service in industry and in the Army and Navy and Air Force. Wendell Wilkie, then a candidate for president, urged all possible help for the Allies short of troops. He called Britain and France America's first line of defense. Even Senator Arthur Vandenberg of Michigan, often labeled isolationist, advocated all possible aid to the Allies. We now know how puny were our plans then, how low our sights. We know now that modern war is not only a ghastly business, but a big business, bigger than any big business ever known. But even in 1941 in Britain, and yes in America, there were men who understood the art of modern war. Professional soldiers and sailors and airmen, for the most part, who knew what combined operations meant who knew about tank warfare and air cover, but these men were pitifully few. We needed millions. How is it then that in two short years or three, we've created a gigantic war corporation, United Nations Incorporated? How is it that we've convinced the enemy at last that his head start has not guaranteed victory? How is it that the enemy's favorite weapon, the airplane, is now our weapon? And what gives us our steady confidence within three short years of Dunkirk? First and foremost, it's our hard professional core of soldiers, the few who had spent their lives in the profession so many of us despise. You run into these men over here in England, Poles, Czechs, Englishmen, Americans, and you can spot them a block away. Such men, for example, is Colonel Frank S. Ross, the transportation genius of the United States Army in this theater. It's a man like Colonel Ross who understands the complexities of war transport, who tells you that the trouble with the cargo is that it can't talk back when you set it down in the wrong place. But there weren't enough of these hard-boiled professionals in the British and American armies. Some weeks ago, a famous neutral diplomat here in London told me he didn't think too much of Allied chances in North Africa, even though he hoped for our success. The German officers, all of them, are professionals, he said. Yours are businessmen with gold-rimmed glasses. They can't learn the art of war overnight. But thank heaven this diplomat had misjudged our businessmen and engineers and scientists. But perhaps you, too, would like some proof, would prefer a closer look to see how an American civilian fits his uniform under the watchful eye of the professional few. Colonel Sidney H. Bingham of New York, USA, is one of these men, and he's right here in London. He's typical of most commuters, even to gold-rimmed glasses. He's chief of military railways for our army in the European theater. But we must admit that Sid Bingham's got the jump on most of us. All his life, he's made trouble his business. In his youth, he was a master engineer in the First World War in France. Then he plunged into an engineering career with the New York subway system. Ultimately, he became the Lions' troubleshooting ace. It was Sid Bingham in peacetime who sat under the underground control center in Grand Central Station waiting for trouble. And when trouble came, it was Sid Bingham who told everybody what to do and how to do it. Sid Bingham has acquired a sixth sense about trouble. Three years before this war started, he convinced his wife and his adolescent son that the younger Bingham should abandon his plans to study peacetime engineering and go to a military school, the Citadel, in Charleston, South Carolina. The lad ranks high in his class, by the way, and he graduates next year. But when war came, the elder Bingham joined up again, and our professional soldiers sat into the European theater of operations, as we've said, as chief of military railways. You see, the British haven't got the manpower to handle all our freight and troop movements as well as their own. So Sid Bingham runs our train. Then there are other little tasks, such as getting together the trains that one day will run over the tracks of European lines. 
We can expect the enemy, you know, to destroy most of these lines. So we're planning skeleton railway systems to carry the burden of supply for our own armies and food for the people of Europe. For this service, Sid Bingham has developed what he calls the breakdown lorry. It's a 10-ton truck designed to take the place of a railroad wrecker train in emergency. It'll run on the roughest highways, in between blown-up sections of railroads. It's compact, Pullman-style, and the equipment is designed in small packages so that two men can have it if necessary. And the Bingham lorry, as they call it in Africa, can do anything a big work train can do except lift an engine back on the track. The British Army has adopted the lorry as standard equipment. Then there's that matter of the ambulance trains. The British had bitter experience with them in France before Dunkirk. They learned, for example, that ambulance trains froze up in cold weather when the engine was disconnected. They were not satisfied with train design, either. They were wasting space wounded soldiers could be using. Our own army doctors pooled facilities with the British, and they wanted improvements, too. Better sterilization, more toilets, better facilities generally on ambulance trains. But how to get them, that was the question. Colonel Frank Ross said it was easy, yet said Bingham. But what does he know about hospital service and medicine, came back to query. Nothing at all was the bland reply. But Sid Bingham can perform miracles with anything that runs on wheels. So they put him to work. And in no time at all, he was drawing doodads on his desk. The old ambulance trains had two kitchens, one for the train staff and a liquid diet kitchen for the wounded. Sid Bingham remembered one night eight years ago in peacetime. His wife was, and still is, by the way, chief assistant to the president of Traft in New York restaurant chain. She needed a compact cooking range for special diets. Women were dieting a lot in those days, too. But this range had to pack into a small space. So eight years ago, Engineer Bingham sat down and designed a stove to cook liquid diets on top and roast underneath. And it all came back to Colonel Bingham at his London desk. A single six-hole range would solve the feeding problem on the ambulance train. And today, all standard British-American hospital trains have a single kitchen. The hospital trains operating in invasion countries, therefore, will be able to take care of more wounded men. Then Sid Bingham ringed up a diesel boiler, commonly used in British laundries. He spotted a car position for this laundry contraption, and now Allied ambulance trains have easy, steady heat, engine or no engine. And Sid Bingham engineered shower baths into ambulance trains without losing space. He added a mechanical sterilizer to every car to prevent the possible spread of infection. Fourteen of these ambulance trains are now ready to run on the rails of Europe, and there'll be twice that many ready in a shorter time than you'd think. But still, Colonel Sid Bingham was not satisfied. The space loss to make way for long stretcher poles worried him. So he... But here he is, Colonel Sidney H. Bingham, to tell us for the first time about one of the truly great discoveries of modern warfare. A simple but revolutionary step forward with untold values for peacetime, too. Colonel Bingham, won't you tell us about it? Well, Morgan, it's too simple. Now, Colonel. All right. You have invented the first collapsible stretcher, an American gadget that may revolutionize the handling of wounded men and save 40% in medical personnel. Now, how did it all happen, sir? I noticed the loss of space on ambulance trains. Space left to make way for long stretcher poles. The doctors assured me there was seldom a compelling need for rigid poles, except for rare spinal cases. Collapsible tubing seemed to be the answer. The tubing could be telescoped within itself, and the stretcher could be carried to the battlefield. All done up in an accordion package, with a strap the same as we carry our gas mask. Then, our medical corps gave me reports from Africa. Tank crews were having trouble handling their wounded, getting them back into the dressing stations, because tanks carry no stretchers. And reports from Australia reveal that jungle brush interfered with the stretcher bearers. The poles tied down both hands, or else four men had to be used. This interfered with the comfort of wounded men. Then, take submarines and small ships. They can't manage room for heavy, rigid stretchers. Am I to understand, then, that nobody has successfully tackled this problem before in all the long history of warfare? That's right. So far as I know, the stretcher simply has not caught up with gadget warfare. So I tried to design a stretcher adaptable for all kinds of modern warfare, for deserts and jungles, for oceans and the air. There are straps close to each end of the new stretcher. In an emergency, a single man can double it up and carry a wounded comrade. Two men make various kinds of pack saddles and carry the man through the jungle without losing the use of their hands. It, is, it can be inflated for comfort or to sustain a man in the water. A single man can carry a stretcher on the battlefield, like a gas mask. 
it stows away in a plane or tank. The accordion stretcher, and nobody ever thought of it before. And it is, as you said, almost too simple for words. But where'd you get all these collapsible ideas for compact things, Colonel? From packing away people in the subway, I, I suppose. Oh, so you're the man responsible for sardining the New York public all these years. It's about time you turned out something from man's comfort. But now that you've invented all these things, that, that leaves you with nothing to do but run our railway trains over here. That only takes 23 hours a day. What about that idle hour, Colonel? Oh, kidding aside, Morgan, I am working on a new gadget. You see, the medical corps has a pub portable hospital now, but it's pretty complicated, a bit too complex for use. Close up under the guns of the front lines. I'm working on a sort of an ironing board type operating room. I don't know how that's going to turn out, though. I do, Colonel. It'll be about the size of a spectacles case, and the surgeons will carry it in on their breast pockets. It'll unfold into a male brother's operating room complete with nurses. But seriously, we ought to let the radio audience in on the rest of the story of Sid Bingham, Army Magician Extraordinary. You come by your inventive instincts honestly. Your great-grandfather was the famous William Headley of England, popularly known as the father of the modern locomotive. He's the man who proved that a smooth steel wheel would run on a smooth steel track. And you've been elected to full membership in the British Institution for Mechanical Engineers. The only American officer, incidentally, so honored. If the United States Army adopts your accordion stretcher, you will receive only $40 for the invention, standard army pay for such things, and will make it available free to all allied armies. If my friend, the worldwide or wise diplomat, would spend a little more time looking around him, discovering men like Colonel Bingham, he'd understand more about why the Axis folded in Tunisia when it did. He'd know why we were converting American businessmen into professional soldiers faster than it's ever been done before in history. And he'd know why President Roosevelt can put up together a 22-word report to us on decisions of strategy with complete confidence that the strategy will be carried out on schedule. As a matter of fact, thousands of men are learning the art of war more rapidly than Hitler ever dreamed that art could be mastered. And these men are improving on the technique of war, inventing devices useful in war, and most of them will be useful in peace too. Like the Bingham lorry we've told you all about, and the Bingham accordion stretcher. Yes, my friend, the world-wise diplomat, would know better about things. And he'd know why Prime Minister Winston Churchill and the President, together with Stalin in the East, can write the ticket on war strategy and confidently expect admission to the grandstand of victory erected by none other than United Nations Incorporated. And now this is Morgan Beatty saying so long until next Saturday. You've been listening to War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen from London by Morgan Beatty, NBC's veteran war observer, in the British capital. Mr. Beatty is presented every Saturday at this same time, so be sure to tune in again a week from now. The program came to you from London and New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. World News Today, brought to you by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. By shortwave broadcast, direct from important overseas stations, as well as the leading news centers of our own country, CBS correspondents are waiting to bring you a complete report from the world's political and battlefronts. But first, here's Doug Edwards. The American campaign on Attu is rapidly drawing to a close. The Navy announces that the largest Jap force on the Aleutian Island has been annihilated, and Tokyo has already admitted final defeat there. The Allied Air Offensive has continued over Western Europe and the Mediterranean, and in North Africa, Generals de Gaulle and Giraud are meeting for the conference to unify all French Empire forces. In Russia, bitter fighting is raging in the Kuban region of the Western Caucasus. But now, for news of the air warfare and the campaign against the U-boat, Admiral Radio takes you direct to CBS London. John Daly reporting. Hitler, the architect of the fortress of Europe, forgot one thing. He forgot to put a roof on his fortress. That one factor, more than any other, will mean the destruction of Hitler's new order that was to last a thousand years. Yesterday, the head of Britain's Bomber Command, Air Chief Marshal Harris, said that the bombing Germany has had is chicken feed compared with what she's going to get as long as she persists in her aggression. Hardly had he spoken when the United States 8th Air Force and the RAF smashed into Hitler's fortress of Europe to prove it. In destructive raids announced last night, 
our fortresses and liberators struck at San Nazaire, Rennes, and La Palice in the greatest daylight blitz of the war. Hard upon the heels of our heavy bombers, the RAF last night found a new target in Germany. The new target is Wuppertal, home of giant IG Farben Industry chemical plants and numerous other war factories. It has just been announced this minute that more than 1,500 tons of bombs were dropped on Wuppertal, starting tremendous fires. 33 bombers are missing from the raid. At the same time, in the one war arena in which Hitler has been able to boast of some success in recent months, the Battle of the Atlantic, the RAF Coastal Command got in a good stiff body blow. It was announced today that Coastal Command bombers have definitely destroyed five German U-boats in ten days. We have been told repeatedly in the last few days that the United Nations are winning the Battle of the Atlantic. Last night, even the Germans indirectly admitted it. One of Goebbels' ace spokesmen told the German people that the U-boat war is a permanent race between the development of weapons of attack and defense, and therefore ups and downs must be expected. That, said the German spokesman, is why our U-boats are not finding so many victims these days. Air Vice Marshal Joubert, Inspector General of the RAF, yesterday described the German armed forces as a three-legged stool. The army leg, he said, was shaky. The Air Force leg cracked, and the U-boat leg as good as broken. You are all familiar with the Spanish and Axis propaganda campaign crying for an end to bombing on humanitarian grounds. Well, this morning, children were going to a Sunday school in a harmless small town on England's southwest coast when seven German fighter bombers flew in from the sea. They thoroughly machine-gunned the town, besides dropping bombs. All the children managed to come out of the raid alive. At least, it's thought they did. The humanitarians lost three of their fighter bombers before they got home. Now back to CBS New York and Doug Edwards. More news in just a moment. But first, here's Warren Sweeney with a word from Admiral Radio. Now, men of the Merchant Marine can tell you only too well how it feels when a thick blanket of fog closes in, particularly among the icebergs of the North Atlantic. It's a feeling of utter helplessness. Men on watch listen to the constant blur of the foghorn, hoping to catch warning echoes. At night, searchlights struggle to pierce the gloom. Speed is held to a snail's pace, yet at any moment may come the grinding crash of a ship striking an unseen iceberg. Such disasters with their loss of ships, cargoes, and lives will soon belong to history. For radar, built by Admiral, already performing so many miracles for America at war, will soon eliminate one of the greatest hazards at sea. Unhampered by fog, storm, or darkness, radar will detect icebergs in plenty of time to avert a crash. No blaring foghorns, no position-revealing searchlights need be employed. And best of all, American ships equipped with radar can safely plunge through fog at full speed. In turning out radar for Uncle Sam, Admiral workers are merely doing familiar tasks in a bigger, better way than ever. In peacetime, the world's largest manufacturer of radio phonograph combinations with automatic record changes, today, radar is America's smart set built by Admiral. Now here once again is Doug Edwards. In the North African war zone, Allied bombers have again raided the Italian Mediterranean islands, and General de Gaulle is now meeting with General Giraud to complete arrangements for French unity. For a direct report on these developments, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Algiers' Winston Burdett reporting. At noon today, a Lockheed Hudson transport plane circled over a tiny airfield in North Africa. On the field were General Giraud, French commander-in-chief, various members of his staff, a guard of honor, a battery of photographers, and a flock of correspondents. The plane taxied over to where everybody was waiting, and out of it stepped General Charles de Gaulle. At last, he was here. De Gaulle and Giro saluted, shook hands, and strode solemnly across the field to review the guard. The formalities were stern and simple. The two poker-faced generals rode back together to Giro's headquarters. And so, rather unobtrusively, the leader of the fighting French movement arrived in North Africa. Algiers is now the capital of fighting France. You may have heard that there's a ban on public demonstrations of any sort in North Africa. Nevertheless, around 4 o'clock this afternoon, several thousand Frenchmen just happened to be standing around in the park in the center of Algiers. They had heard that the goal was coming to lay a wreath on the monument of the unknown dead. 
Children climbed into trees to get a better view. And when the gold finally appeared, the crowd burst through the police cordon, flooded the park, shouted, Vive la République, and Vive the gold. They really let go. A little later, General de Gaulle received the press. He spoke of the union of all French forces and of the new Central Committee which is to be set up in order to realize that union. This committee, he said, must have three characteristics. And I quote him, It must be physically and morally capable of directing France at war. Morally, because it is important that the men with power should be worthy to lead. You know what I mean. Secondly, its power should be based on real French sovereignty. The Allies should be able to deal with men who are upright and proud. And thirdly, he said, the committee must act in harmony with the mass of the French nation. And he added, it would be impossible to build something with which the French people are not in accord. General de Gaulle spoke with the air of a man who knew precisely what he wanted. I return you now to CBS in New York. The increasing Allied threat to what the Germans call their European fortress brings a variety of reports from within the enemy countries to the listening posts in neutral Switzerland. For a direct report, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Bern, Howard K. Smith reporting. While the Axis and its fighting friends in Madrid have this week suddenly discovered that air bombardment is inhuman, Today, in the mountains of Yugoslavia, German bombers have raised four undefended villages to the ground. The towns are in Montenegro. There were no soldiers in them and no anti-aircraft guns. The citizens didn't even have a rifle to defend themselves with. They just happened to be a part of the big territory the partisans have taken away from the Axis in Montenegro. On one of the towns, named Shabalyak, the Germans dropped 40,000 pounds of bombs, and that is 10 pounds of explosives for every person in town. The bombardments were undertaken as part of the Axis's new frantic offensive against the Yugoslav partisans to break their resistance before the United Nations can attack Europe. Today, the partisans have admitted that they have had to retreat before the German storm. The front on which they are fighting is about a hundred miles long. It extends from just south of Sarajevo to just north of Albania. On the back bottom of that front, the Germans, with tanks and bombers, took away from the partisans the important terminus of Kolachin, about ten miles north of the Albanian border. The German base of operations against them, the partisan radio said, is the Montenegrin town of Plevolje, and they begged the Allies to send a few planes over Plevolje with bombs, preferably big bombs, just to let the Germans know that the partisans are not the friendless peasants they sometimes claim to be. The partisans believe they can take any town or city in Yugoslavia with air support. Today, in fact, their forces stand just 20 miles outside the Italian port of Fiumi. In two years of guerrilla fighting, the partisans have carried offensives to within 10 miles of the Croatian capital of Zagreb and into the outskirts of Banja Luka. But each time, they've turned away from the big cities because they haven't got the bombers. They're hoping, though, that someday the Allies will send bombers. And if they do, the partisans think they can take their country away from the Axis with very little additional help. I now return you to New York. Next, for news of developments in South America, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Buenos Aires, Herbert Clark reporting. CBS Buenos Aires. President Ramon Castillo decided this week that the Argentine Congress should open its regular 1943 session on June 8th. That decision and the choice of the date are two more indications that Senator Robustiano Patron Costas will be named to succeed Castillo at next September's presidential elections. Patron Costas became the crown prince last February when Castillo picked him as a guarantee of the continuance of present policies. The presidential wishes have been respected by all factions of the conservative political machine. And Patron Costas will be formally named the rightest candidate on June 7th. 
Liberals had planned to choose their candidate on June 8th. But those plans were upset when Castillo selected the date as the occasion of his report on the state of the nation. Liberals, who are the majority in Argentina but are badly disunited, got together on an excellent pro-democratic, anti-totalitarian platform early this month. But they went back to bickering over candidates immediately. And the chances are dim today for the formation of a democratic union, a sort of a popular front, to contest that election. We don't expect much legislative production from Congress this year, partly because attention will be fixed on the elections, and partly because liberals plan to spend considerable time asking Castillo to explain some of his actions. They want to know, for instance, why the government keeps constitutional guarantees suspended by the state of seeds decreed in December of 1941 and indefinitely extended last December despite a congressional order to lift it. Castillo gave a partial answer, or rather a partial refusal to answer, this week when he sent a message to Congress asking a further extension on the grounds that individual liberties were dangerous, that the government's liberty of decision would be compromised if the people were free to criticize. This is Herbert Clark in Buenos Aires, returning you to Columbia in New York. There is heavy fighting today on land and in the air at both ends of the 1,600-mile Russian front. The Germans are attempting day and night air attacks on Leningrad, and Moscow reports that Soviet fighters and anti-aircraft batteries have knocked down 20 enemy planes. At the same time, German guns have opened up on Leningrad, battering the city with shells. But the Russian defenders are reported to be answering shell for shell without budging from their positions. A few hours ago, the Navy announced another victory by our forces on Attu Island. For this news and other developments, Admiral Radio takes you now to CBS Washington, Lee White reporting. The bloody battle for Attu is over at last. According to a laconic Navy communique this afternoon, the Japanese made a suicidal counterattack on the right flank of our forces on the floor of Chichigoff Valley. Except for snipers, the communique reads, this enemy force was annihilated. On Friday, American troops had exterminated the last of the Japanese defenders of the mountain known as Fish Hook Ridge. Early this morning, the Tokyo Radio broadcast an official communique stating that the Imperial General Staff has been out of touch with its forces on Attu for more than 24 hours. It is believed, said Tokyo, that all officers and men of the Imperial Garrison died a glorious death for their country. According to Tokyo, the Japanese garrison numbered about 2,000 men. Again, according to Tokyo, our own forces numbered 20,000 men with superior equipment. What held us up so long was not the strength of Japanese resistance so much as the foul weather conditions which have prevented air activity on all but two or three days of the three weeks the campaign lasted. The Navy communique merely says that Japanese casualties have been high. But according to the German version of Tokyo's story, every last Japanese on the island has been killed. Disabled soldiers who were unable to participate in the last desperate counterattack are said to have committed suicide. Because of the gasoline shortage, there were sparse crowds at the Memorial Day services in Washington today. At 11.30 this morning, General Somerville placed a wreath on the tomb of the unknown soldier in the name of President Roosevelt. Now, while this program is going on, the American Legion is holding its annual service in memory of the dead of the First World War. By special permission of the White House, color guards and other officials took taxis or drove their own cars to Arlington Cemetery. But the majority of the Legionnaires presumably walked. An OPA ordered last night banned the use of private cars in driving to and from patriotic celebrations. Despite congressional opposition to food subsidies, the OPA has ordered a 10% rollback in the retail price of butter to become effective on June 10th. The average saving to consumers will be five and a half cents a pound. Rollbacks in the price of meat and coffee are expected shortly, and the total subsidy expenditure on these three items alone will come to $400 million a year. I return you now to New York. On the far eastern fighting front, Chinese dispatches say Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's troops have captured Yuyang Quan, which is 35 miles south of Yichang. This town has been a focal point in the Jap offensive up the Yangtze River toward Chungking. There was another air raid alarm in Chungking this morning, the second in as many days. 
But as yet, there's no indication that Jap planes attacked at any point in the province. And now, for an analysis of the new Japanese drive in China, here is Columbia's military analyst, Major George Fielding Elliott. It is not yet clear whether the Japanese offensive in the upper Yangtze Valley is really a major drive aimed at the Chinese temporary capital at Chongqing. Latest Chinese dispatches tend to play down this theory, but from other sources the situation is reported as potentially serious. Certainly an advance from Ichang, the Japanese base highest up the Great River, all the way to Chongqing would be a formidable operation. The greatest difficulty would be that of supply. The river itself must be the main Japanese supply line. The railways would be of little assistance since the Japanese do not control either the northern or the southern main lines which reach the river at Hankow. An enormous number of river craft would be needed and would have to be kept in constant operation in order to supply a force which could hardly number less than 500,000 combat troops. Even if this could be done in theory, the front on which the Japanese would have to advance must be comparatively narrow. The farther the Japanese go from Ichang, the more their flanks will become exposed to Chinese attack. This has been the history of every Japanese attempt to advance from their present positions during the past two years. First comes initial success, as the powerful Japanese striking force moves out close to its base and after thorough preparation. Then comes increased Chinese resistance, as the Japanese get farther away from their bases. Finally, come Chinese attacks on the Japanese flanks, and raids against their lines of communication. Invariably, this has produced the same result. The Japanese have had to fall back to their original positions, or at least to content themselves with minor and inconclusive gains. It may very well be that this process is now about to repeat itself on a somewhat larger scale in the upper Yangtze Valley. However, a new factor, that of air power, may be introduced if the 14th U.S. Air Force under General Chenault can be reinforced. That was Major George Fielding Elliott. Out in Pearl Harbor, our fighting men are closely watching developments in the battle against the Japs to the north and the southwest. For a report on our heroes who've seen action against the enemy and who are looking for more of it, Admiral Radio takes you to CBS Honolulu, Webley Edwards reporting. Once in a while, your correspondent is at Pearl Harbor on a bright morning when a submarine of the Pacific Fleet comes home to refuel, get more torpedoes, and let the officers and men stretch their legs a bit on solid earth. You never forget it. I watched such an arrival. Slowly the sub made its way through the entrance of Pearl Harbor and up toward the submarine base. It was no gala arrival. Only a few knew about it until she was there. But as she came up the harbor almost to a man... The civilian war workers who chanced to see her pulled up to a kind of respectful attention and then cheered her. Navy craft along her course paid quiet honor to her. No fanfare or tinsel of parade stuff here. It was more of a good-natured, bantering kind of greeting that fighting men give to other fighting men they respect. The sub came alongside and you could see the green sea moss on her. A sure indication of a long time at sea. On her deck were most of her crew grinning the sheepish grin that fellows wear when they come home after winning the state championship in football or basketball. These men had done well and they knew it, but they were trying their best to be modest and casual about it. The officers and crew who'd worn dungarees for days on end had broken out their store clothes. You could tell by the fold showing crosswise on the breeches that the cloth had been folded in lockers for quite some time. Some wore beards, others were carefully shaved. All looked healthy and well-fed, but a little tired. There was a kind of a band on the dock. Most Navy bandsmen are busy fighting somewhere these days, but somebody had rounded up a drum and a trombone, a few cornets, and a big bass horn. As the sub came alongside, they blared out anchors away in a way that did your heart good. Nobody said much until the sub tied up, and a group of officers from the sub base went aboard to congratulate the winning commander. Shoreside sailors were there to meet former shipmates on the sub, and they look admiringly at the pennants on the conning tower. Each sub that comes in shows its record by paintings on the ship's side or by pennants. This one had five pennants of blue, the white silhouette of the five Jap ships she'd sunk. Some were in the shape of merchant ships or transports, and some were undeniably replicas of Jap warships. The official greetings were over, and immediately everybody started yelling greetings from shore to sub and back again, and then something happened that made you feel good. 
Down the dock came a small truck and put a half dozen big mail sacks aboard. And right on that submarine deck, Uncle Sam distributed the mail to some of his boys who'd been many weeks, thousands of miles from any post office. Then the shore crew took over already starting the work of overhauling, restuffing, refueling, and reloading torpedoes. And the submarine crew took off for a few days' leave, some still reading their mail. All except one seaman, and I heard him say to a shoreside buddy, Hey, Mac, lead me to the nearest telephone. I hope he had fun, because it wouldn't be long before he and the other submariners would be off to sea again to hunt and be hunted. And when that time comes, he and the other subfighters are always raring to get underway. They have adventure in their hearts, and they thrive on danger. I guess that's why they shoot down so many Jap ships. This is Wobbly Edwards at Pearl Harbor. I return you now to New York. In the Southwest Pacific, General MacArthur's flyers have carried out the greatest number of sorties yet undertaken in a single day. They ranged more than a thousand miles from Australia to bomb three islands in the small Sunday group. Off New Guinea, our Liberator bombers spotted a small Jap convoy, attacked it, and left a 5,000-ton transport smoking. Two small warships and three more merchant vessels were in the convoy, which was last seen at Hansa Bay, which is midway between Wewak and Madang. Another Liberator scored damaging near misses on a thousand-ton cargo ship, pulling six barges in the Banda Sea area, 700 miles from Darwin. And now, once again, here is Warren Sweeney with a message from our sponsor. How quickly can radar, built by Admiral, detect the presence and determine the range of an enemy ship or plane? Detection takes about as much time as it does to sweep the horizon with a pair of binoculars. Radar scans the sea and air with a focused beam of ultra-high-frequency waves that travel with the speed of light. When these waves strike a ship or plane, they bounce back, and thus the enemy is detected. But that's not all. Since these radio waves travel at a constant speed, 186,000 miles per second, the time required for them to travel to a reflecting surface and return provides a mean for determining the exact range or distance to the enemy target. Admiral Built Radar translates this time into distance automatically, so it can be read much like the speedometer of a car. Thus, every move of the enemy ship or plane, as it approaches or retires, is constantly recorded before the eyes of the radar operator. Next week, Admiral will tell you how radar is helping to guard our coastlines against enemy attack. Another important assignment for this amazing weapon of war built by Admiral. Women of America, the WAAC is accepting enlistments today for the women radio operators, radio repairmen, and teletypewriter operators that are urgently needed by the armed forces to release men for active combat duty. Do your part in America's war for freedom by helping the WAAC and the Signal Corps get the message through. Go to your local U.S. Army recruiting and induction station today for full information. World News Today is brought to you each Sunday at this hour by Continental Radio and Television Corporation, makers of Admiral Radio, America's smart set. Be sure to listen again next Sunday when Admiral brings you World News Today by shortwave, direct from the leading news centers of the world. Warren Sweeney speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater rigged a building in Chicago. The... Well, no, Stalin wasn't stolen when he told the beast of Berlin that they'd never rest contented till they had driven him from the land. So we called the Yanks and English and proceeded to extinguish the Fuhrer and his vermin. This is how it all began. Now the devil he was reading in the good book one day how the Lord created Adam to walk the righteous way. And it made the devil jealous. He turned green up to his horns and he swore by things unholy that he'd make one of his own. So he packed two suitcases full of grief and misery. And he caught the midnight special going down in Germany. 
Then he mixed his lies and hatred with fire and brimstone. Then the devil sat upon it. That's how Adolf was born. Now Adolf got the notion that he was the master race, and he swore he'd bring new order and put mankind in its place. So he set his scheme in motion and was winning everywhere until he up and got the notion for to kick that Russian bear. Well, now Stalin wasn't stolen when he told the beast of burden that he never rest content to tell the head driven him from the land. So he called the Yanks and English and proceeded to extinguish. The Führer and his vermin, this is how it all began. Yep, he kicked that noble Russian, but it wasn't very long before Adolf got suspicious that he had done something wrong. Cause that bear grabbed the Führer and gave him an awful fight. Seventeen months he scrapped the Führer, tooth and claw, day and night. Then that bear smacked the Führer with the mighty armored paw. And Adolf broke all records running backwards to Kharkov. Then Goebbels sent a message to the people everywhere that if they couldn't help the Führer, God don't help the Russian bear. Well, now Stalin wasn't stolen when he told the beast of Berlin that he'd never rest content to tell the head driven him from the land. So we called the Yanks and English and proceeded to extinguish the Führer and his vermin. This is how it all began. Then this bear calls on his buddy, the a noble fighting yank, and they set the Führer running with their ships and planes and tanks. Now the Führer's having nightmares, cause the Führer knows darn well that the devil's done road to welcome on his residence in Hell. Now Stalin wasn't stolen when he told the beast of Berlin that he'd never rest content to tell the head driven him from the land. So we called the Yanks and English and proceeded to extinguish. The Führer and his vermin, that is how it all began.